Hello and welcome to today's live broadcast of the House of Assembly. This is the National Television Network and I am Alicia Ali from the Government Information Service. Thank you for joining us here in downtown Castries at the House of Parliament on Library Street. For those of you who are unable to catch us via the television on NTN, you can watch us live on www.govt.lc and also on the Government of St. Lucia's Facebook page. Now, what do we have today? We have three motions down on the order paper. Uh, the first motion is that Parliament authorizes the Minister for Finance to borrow the sum of U.S. $2.8 million from the Caribbean Development Bank's special fund resources to finance the Youth Empowerment Project. The second motion down is for Parliament to authorize the Minister for Finance to guarantee an amount not exceeding 15.8 8 million EC dollars to secure payment of a contract awarded to First Start Construction Company Limited to finance the Miku Road Rehabilitation Project and the Diga to Deriso Road Rehabilitation Works. Now, the third motion on our order paper for today does not come from the government side of the house it is actually being proposed by the member for Castries South uh, opposition member Dr. Ernest Hilaire and it is that Parliament, by negative resolution, approved Regulation 73A and Regulation 79 um, of the Citizen by Investment Act. As you know, in December 2016, Prime Minister of St. Lucia, Honorable Alan M. Shastney, announced changes to the regulation for the CIP program here on Ireland. Uh, what he had proposed, well, what he did back then in December, was to actually lower the amount that of an investment an investor can put into our investment fund and uh, according to the Prime Minister it was so that St. Lucia has a more competitive uh, CIP program because as you know both Dominica and St. Kitts has a long-running CIP program and the Prime Minister said in order to make it viable we had to lower the regulations to be more globally competitive uh, the CIP program has been going under some uh, some modifications uh, since December 2016, and that includes a change of board and a new CEO um, for a new chairman of the board and also a new CEO. And we see the Speaker of the House of Assembly, Honorable Leon Theodore John, is making her way into the chamber. She is preceded by the Sergeant at Arms carrying the mace, and this signals the start of today's proceedings, uh, which promises to be quite interesting. So let's take it now to the chamber floor. Let us pray. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit, Almighty God, by whom all kings reign and princes decree justice, and from whom alone cometh all counsel, wisdom, and understanding, we thine unworthy servants, here gathered together in thy name, do most humbly beseech thee to send down thy heavenly wisdom from above, to direct and guide us in all our consultations. And grant that we, having thy fear, always before our eyes, and laying aside all private interests, prejudices, and partial affections, the result of all our counsels may be to the glory of thy blessed name, the maintenance of true religion and justice, the safety, honor, and happiness of the queen, the public will, peace and tranquility of St. Lucia, and the uniting and knitting together of hearts of all persons and estates within the same, in the true Christian love and charity, one towards another, through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. Amen. The grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, and the love of God, and the fellowship of the Holy Ghost be with us all evermore. Amen.
announcements. Honorable members, I wish for you to join me in the, in the observance of one minute silence as we remember those unfortunate to have lost lives during the devastation passing of Hurricane Irma. We remember also particularly those within the countries or the islands, sister islands within the CPA, Caribbean, Atlantic, and Pacific region, um, and the devastation there. So please, honorable members, if you may, join me in one minute silence in observation, loss of lives, and the effects of tropical hurricane Irma. One minute starts now. Thank you. Honorable members, I am in receipt of letters of apologies from the honorable member for Castries North, who unfortunately is out of state on business. He apologizes for his absence. Also, I am also in receipt of communication from the honorable Minister for Agriculture, who unfortunately, due to the passing of Irma, he has been delayed and was supposed to have been here but cannot be here with us and is still away. I wish to inform honorable members that the, the I attended together with the honorable President of the Senate, um, as well as the Deputy Clerk, the meeting of presiding officers and clerks of the Caribbean, Atlantic, and Americas region in Tobago, which is hosted by Trinidad and Tobago in mid-August. And um, I, on that note, I will speak further on it when I meet with honorable members and I wish to take the opportunity to remind honorable members that we are to have a less formal meeting of all members immediately after the sitting this afternoon. Um, I've also just recently returned from a meeting in Trinidad. Um, it was by Pal Americas regarding um, public participation in the governance of country and accountability. And um, you will hear further from me on this as well, but basically the meeting was very enlightening and basically serves to um, seek from parliamentarians how we can engage the public more and be, the public be more informed in the affairs of the parliament and running of the parliament and the parliament office and legislature in the country. Statements by ministers. Honorable Prime Minister, Leader of Government Business. Madam Speaker, uh, members of the House, I felt it was appropriate at this time, given the historic last two weeks that we've encountered in our region, to brief members of the House and you, Madam Speaker, and the public of St. Lucia as to what has been transpiring and what we believe are the next steps moving forward, Madam Speaker. 
Madam Speaker, we have seen in our region three hurricanes that were affecting our region in different areas almost simultaneously. Irma, Jose, and Katrina, or Katy, Katia. Um, we also had during the same period of time, a magnitude 8.1 earthquake. So let me commence, Madam Speaker, by first of all, sending my condolences, our best wishes to the government of Mexico, to the people of Mexico. My understanding is that almost 100 people have lost their lives in the past week, and thousands and thousands of people have lost their homes. I also want to send my condolences to the people in the government of Cuba who quite unexpectedly bore the brunt of Hurricane Irma. And I think you've seen the pictures online. I certainly had the opportunity to be speaking to the ambassador to Cuba here in St. Lucia. And while he reassured me that the Cuban government re relocated 800,000 people prior to the storm and that the area that was devastated was not a highly populated area. Um, I think that we can all see the fact that 10 people have died um, and we see the, the physical impact um, that that country um, has a road on to recover. And I just want to again reassure um, the ambassador through him to his government and to the people of, Compu of Cuba, St. Lucia's total support and sympathy of what transpired. Madam Speaker, as chairman of the OECS, I had the opportunity to do uh, a recce tour. On Sunday, I was accompanied by the, the, the Secretary General of the OECS, Dr. Jules, and also by Prime Minister Skerritt. Um, and we visited Anguilla, the BVI, Antigua, and St. Kitts. The devastation in BVI and also in Ang Anguilla is very severe. Um, literally every single telephone pole and electrical pole that you saw was down. Um, roofs that had galvanized roofing are all down. Um, in the case of BVI, um, the work to start reconstructing the country or even simply cleaning up the country had not begun. And also Sedima was only making it into the BVI for the first time on Sunday. Anguilla, the devastation was equally as, as harsh. In fact, the vast majority of schools are without roofs. Um, but I found that the people had begun the cleanup process and we're awaiting the next call of action. My understanding is that the British government have uh, approved $34 million for their affected countries in this region. I did not have the opportunity, Madam Speaker, to make it to St. Martin. Um, unfortunately, St. Martin was deemed unsafe to go to. Um, but the reports out of St. Martin and St. Thomas are equally frightening in terms of what has transpired. We are intending to have a meeting of the OECS heads tomorrow, Madam Speaker, with the intent to give a report as to what our findings were and to make recommendations on some things that we should do. <coughs> Clearly, most of the families here in St. Lucia would recognize and appreciate that September is the beginning of a new school season. And particularly the kids who are in Form 4 and Form 5 in the devastated countries or the affected countries. Clearly, despite their own peril and their own situation, would be extremely concerned about what was going to happen with the children. The good news, Madam Speaker, is we do have a precedent that was established when we had Hurricane Ivan in Grenada, in which the OECS and CARICOM countries adopted kids from Grenada to assist them during that one term while Grenada was recovering. And I think that we may have to do something very similar in this instance. Um, St. Lucia, as you know, Madam Speaker, um, has been offering all kinds of assistance um, to the affected countries. 
Um, we've offered uh, free landing fees. We've offered to keep our airports open 24 hours because when we initially saw the storm coming, it was expectation that the devastation that you saw in the BVI in St. Martin potentially could have happened in Guadeloupe and in Antigua and in St. Kitts. But thankfully, Antigua and St. Kitts were not nearly as affected as badly as the other countries. Obviously, Barbuda, we've seen, has been severely impacted. In fact, I had the opportunity to go and miss, meet with some of the Barbudians that had been extracted from Barbuda, um, that are being currently hosted by the government of Antigua in Antigua. Um, but clearly, the road to recovery is going to be long and arduous and extremely expensive. Um, it, is going, it goes without saying, Madam Speaker, that the standards that we have in our countries um, currently are not sufficient to be able to withstand a repeated uh, impacts of hurricanes of this nature. To think that in the case of Houston, a report had been prepared prior to the hurricane last year in which Houston was asked to spend $15 billion in making that country, that city, much more resilient. As a result of not spending that money, Madam Speaker, the bill is estimated today to be $150 billion to be able to recover. And I think the same can be said of our islands. And whereas in absolute terms, the money amount may not be the same, but if we don't find ourselves with the necessary resources, Madam Speaker, to be able to address our infrastructural needs in our countries, we are going to be in trouble. The other thing that was very interesting, Madam Speaker, was that it's the first time I think that we've had a hurricane that would have impacted the countries that would have probably been the ones to give us support. So your St. Martins, your US territories, your Puerto Rico, and then even Miami. So days before Irma had reached Miami, Miami was shut down for all intents and purposes. I mean, I think we had our last flight from American Airlines on Thursday of last week. And we're hoping to hear our announcement that they're going to be opening up very soon. It tells us that we are overly dependent on the North, Madam Speaker. And I think as a country, we have to start looking more aggressively and as a region more aggressively to the South, even in terms of food supplies. So let us assume for a moment that Irma had stayed on its path and had, had devastated the Miami area. Where would we be? And again, with the U.S. pouring their resources in there, it means that we have to be able to develop different relationships. The other thing that was very clear, Madam Speaker, and I also say to my colleagues in the House, is that SEDEMA has been a wonderful and incredible organization. But SEDEMA needs to broaden its role past CARICOM. And I think that we have waited long enough to develop a more substantial relationship with those dependent countries. I speak of the St. Martins, the French St. Martin, the Dutch St. Martin, with the BVI and the British territories, and also with the US territories. Because what happened was, is the normal protocol that when an emergency happens that Sidima takes control, in those countries, they had no status. And I say this, Madam Speaker, because I think that all my colleagues would agree with me that we have every right to ask and to participate in what is taking place in those countries, given the number of our own nationals that are residing in those countries. And I think that that was something that the heads took very seriously and in the plans that we had that we focused heavily on. In fact, the reason why the OECS came together, coalesced together, was with the, un the clear understanding that our nationals were going to be affected. So Madam Speaker, um, I will continue to provide updates to members on the opposite side. In fact, I've done my best to speak to the leader of the opposition on several occasions, and I want to thank him for his support um, and his moral support and giving me the ear that we could share some ideas. Not every conversation I've had a chance to be able to speak to the leader of the opposition. So for instance, on the issue of taking in prisoners, I did not have the opportunity to discuss it with the leader of the opposition. But I felt very strongly, Madam Speaker, that if in fact our own citizens were in threats, wait. And when I got the initial report, Madam Speaker, that the prison in BVI had been breached. And in fact, up to now, there's over 120 criminals walking freely 
in the BVI. I don't even know if they're still there or if they're gone. We've obviously heard through our own family members of what's taking place in St. Martin. And I think the fact that we've not gotten more news out of Turks and Caicos tells us the level of devastation that has transpired in Turks and Caicos. Um, so the government of St. Lucia, Madam Speaker, has agreed um, at the request of the British government to take in three prisoners that would be coming in from Turks and Caicos. Um, I have consulted with the uh, Commissioner of Police and the Minister of Security, as well as with the staff at Bordelais. Um, the initial inventory is that we had the capacity to be able, if needs be, on a temporary basis, to be able to house at least 50 prisoners. Um, in this instance, we are only bringing in three prisoners at the first request, and those prisoners are going to be coming in from Turks and Caicos. So let me take this opportunity to say to all St. Lucians that um, be assured that your security is not being put at risk. But I think that it is the humane thing for us to have done. And a time when our brothers and sisters, our friends and family need us the most is the most important time for us to stand up and to be counted. I thank you, Madam Speaker. Papers to be laid. Honorable Prime Minister, Minister for Finance, Economic Growth, Leader of Government Business. I beg to lay the following papers standing in my name. Statutory instrument number 56 of 2017, value added tax amendment regulations. Statutory instrument number 57 of 2017, aliens license exemption, St. Lucia Distillers Limited order. Statutory instrument number 60 of 2017, Finance Administrative Act, Administration Act, a resolution of Parliament authorizing the Minister of Finance to borrow by means of advances. Statutory instrument number 61 of 2017, Legal Profession Eligibility, Lori Nato Christina Yard Order. Statutory instrument number 63 of 2017, Excise Tax Amendment of Schedule 1, number number two, order. Statutory instrument number 64 of 2017, Finance Administration Act, resolution of Parliament to borrow for capital expenditure, OECS Regional Tourism Competitiveness Project. Statutory instrument number 65 of 2017, Finance Administrative Act, resolution of Parliament to borrow for capital or recurrent expenditure, Eighth Water Denry Water Supply Redevelopment Project. Statutory instrument number 66 of 2017, resolution of Parliament to approve draft value added tax amendment for the Schedule 3 order. Statutory instrument number 67 of 2017, National Savings and Development Bonds Act, resolution of Parliament to raise funds by issue of saving bonds. Statutory instrument number 69 of 2017, Fiscal Incentives, Raj Products Limited, Amendment Order. Statutory Instrument Number 70 of 2017, Special Development Areas Amendment of Schedule 1 Order. Statutory Instrument Number 74 of 2017, Value Added Tax Amendment of Schedule 3 Order. Statutory Instrument Number 77 of 2017, Investment, Invest St. Lucia, Labry and Viewfort Vesting Order. Statutory instrument number 78 of 2017, Special Development Areas Amendment of Schedule 1 Order. Statutory instrument number 79 of 2017, Invest St. Lucia Labry Vesting Order. Statutory instrument number 81 of 2017, Legal Profession Eligibility, Alagram Gilbert Russell Drummond uh, Codellini Order. Statutory instrument number 82 of 2017, International Business Companies Declaration of Head Office Company, Digicel Caribbean Company Limited. Statutory instrument number 84 of 2017, Excise Tax Amendment of Schedule 1, number 4 order. Statutory instrument number 87 of 2017, Fiscal Incentives Fresh Start Construction Company Limited Order, National Insurance Corporation Annual Report 2016, 
St. Lucia Electoral Department Report of the Chief Elections Officer on the general election held on June 6 of 2016, and the Government of St. Lucia Report on the Financial Statements of the Government of St. Lucia for the year ended March 31, 2010. Um, if I may, Honorable Prime Minister, I, I think you missed 68. Can you please? Statutory instrument number 68. Statutory instrument number 68 of 2017, legal profession, eligibility, Lashona Rafaela Tosawaya, Andrews order. Statutory instrument, I read that one, uh, but I'm happy to repeat it again, Madam Speaker. Statutory instrument number 84 of 2017, excise tax amendment of schedule one, number, number four. four order. Yeah. Thank you. Honorable Minister in the Office of the Prime Minister with responsibility for commerce, industry, enterprise development, and consumer affairs. Madam Speaker, I beg to lay the following papers standing in my name. Statutory Instrument Number 62 of 2017, Price Control Amendment Number 10, Order. Statutory Instrument Number 75 of 2017, Price Control Amendment Number 11, Order. Statutory Instrument Number 83 of 2017, Price Control Amendment Number 12, Order. Statutory Instrument Number 88 of 2017, Price Control Amendment Number 13, Order. St. Lucia Bureau of Standards Annual Report 2015 to 2016. Honorable Minister in the Office of the Prime Minister with responsibility for tourism, information, and broadcasting. Madam Speaker, I beg to lay the following papers laying in my name. Um, standing in my name, Madam Speaker, statutory instrument number 58 of 2017, Tourism Incentives, Aldante Limited Order. Statutory instrument number 59 of 2017, Tourism Incentives, Rodney Bay Marina Limited Order. Statutory instrument number 72 of 2017, Tourism Incentives, Lesport, St. Lucia Limited Order. Statutory instrument number 73 of 2017, Tourism Incentives, Tropical Breeze Order. Statutory instrument number 80 of 2017, Tourism Stimulus and Investment, Calabash Cove Limited Order. Statutory instrument number 85 of 2017, Tourism Incentives, Spice of India, order. Statutory instrument number 86 of 2017, Tourism Incentives, Bay Gardens Limited, order. Motions. Honorable Prime Minister, Minister for Finance, Leader of Government Business. Madam Speaker, whereas it is provided by Section 39.1 of the Finance Administration Act, Cap 1501, that the Minister of Finance may, by resolution of Parliament, borrow money from a bank or other financial institution for the capital expenditure for, of government. And whereas it is further provided under Section 42.1 of the said Act that they shall be charged upon and paid out of the consolidated fund all debt charges for which the government is liable. And whereas the Minister of Finance consider, considers it necessary to borrow 2,860,000 US dollars from the Caribbean Development Bank's Special Fund Resources, SFR, to finance the Youth Empowerment Project. And whereas the interest is payable at a rate of 2.5% 2 per, 2 per annum on the amount of the loan withdrawn and outstanding. The loan is repayable in 32 equal or approximately equal and consecutive quarterly installments on each due of the date of the first day of January, first day of April, first day of July, and first day of October, commencing on the first due date immediately following the expiration 
of four years after the date of the loan agreement or on a latter date due that the Caribbean Development Bank specifies in writing. Be it resolved that Parliament authorizes the Minister for Finance to borrow $2,860,000 U.S. dollars from the Caribbean Development Bank Special Fund Resources, SFR, to finance the Youth Empowerment Project. Be it further resolved, the interest is payable at the rate of 2.5% per annum on the amount of the loan withdrawn and outstanding. The loan is repayable in 32 equal or approximately equal and consecutive quarterly in, in, installments on each due date of the first day of January, the first day of April, the first day of July, the first day of October, commencing on the first due date immediately following the expiration of the four years after the date of the loan agreement or on a latter date that the Caribbean Development Bank specifies in writing. Honorable members, the question is that Parliament authorizes the Minister for Finance to borrow the sum of two million US two million eight hundred and sixty thousand dollars from the Caribbean Development Bank Special Fund Resources SFR to finance the Youth Empowerment Project. Be it further resolved that the interest is payable at a rate of 2.5% per annum on the amount of the loan withdrawn and outstanding, and B, the loan is payable in 32 equal or approximately equal and consecutive quarterly installments on each due date of the first, of Jan the first day of January, the first day of April, the first day of July, the first day of October, commencing on the first due date immediately following the expiration of four years after the date of the loan agreement or on a later due date that the Caribbean Development Bank specifies in writing. Honorable Prime Minister, Leader of Government Business. Madam Speaker, first let me emphasize that this project in itself is not going to resolve youth crime. But this project is clearly a beginning of a pilot project. And depending on the success and what we learn from this program, the intention of my government is to be able to expand it where it has been successful. The Youth Empowerment for Life project is financed through the loans and grants facilitated, as we know, by the Caribbean Development Bank. The Caribbean Development Bank approved the loan to the government of St. Lucia on October 13th of 2016 in the amount of $2,860,000 U.S. dollars from CDB's special funds resource. A grant in the amount of $800,000 is also provided under this project. The Youth Empowerment for Life project is fo focused on mitigating risk factors that trigger criminal and antisocial behaviors at the individual, family, community, and societal levels, with special emphasis on young men and vulnerable groups, especially children, at-risk youth and women. This objective will be achieved through A, an integrated youth court diversion program, B, an integrated community-based transformation program. C, a community-based policing initiatives. And D, design options for the George V Park in the city of Castries. And then E, the implementation. Overall, the project comprises the following main components, Madam Speaker. The Youth Court Diversion Program, this program comprises of two elements and will be delivered in two separate centers. The youth reduction, uh, re 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 recidivism reduction, this subcomponent will cater to young persons aged 12 to 19, will include pre and post court diversion, youth who have been recommended to the program or receive non-custodial sentencing. It will cater to high school dropouts and approximately 20 participants targeted per six-month cycle. This element will be implemented by the Probation and Parole Services Unit. The second part, Madam Speaker, is out of the school suspension program. 
This element will be implemented by the Department of Education and will accommodate secondary school students who have been suspended for a period greater than five school days on a non-custodial basis. A maximum of 20 students can be accommodated. Two, the Integrated Community-Based Transformation Program. This element will be implemented by the Department of Equity and will complement some of the work already done. Community after-school programs, community summer programs. It will also include workshops and training related to sports and development, creative and expressive arts, and business mentoring and life coaching. The third part is community-based uh, policing. The pilot includes development of a community-based policing strategy and training manual, short-term training and study tours, and community-based policing symposium. The fourth part is design options for the George V Park, a consultancy to undertake an assessment and design options for upgrading the park will be undertaken. This component will be implemented by the Castries City Council. And the, fi the fifth one is the implementation support. The unit will be established in the Department of Equity, Social Justice, and Empowerment and Human Resources. Madam Speaker, the project is expected to be implemented over a period of 36 months. The borrower shall repay the amount withdrawn from the SFR loan account in 80, 32 equal or approximately equal and consecutive quarterly installments on January 1st, April 1st, July 1st, and October 1st of each year. The borrower shall pay the interest at the rate of 2.5% per annum on the amount of the SFR promotion withdrawn. Such interest shall be payable on a quarterly basis. So in essence, Madam Speaker, this is a critical project that government thinks it's necessary in order to be get implemented to start the, the road to recovery. Consecutive governments have been doing a lot of work in terms of trying to target our youth. And we're trying to create programs now that we know whether they're successful. And the intention is for this to be able to dovetail into our after school program that we're gonna be working with, as well as our youth programs targeted to being able to get youth back into business. So again, thank you very much, Madam Speaker. Honorable Minister in the Office of the Prime Minister's Responsibility for External Affairs. Thank you, Madam Speaker. Good morning. Uh, I thought I would rise very briefly just to support this motion moved by the Honorable Prime Minister. This project, the Youth Empowerment Project, um, is going to be piloted in my constituency, being one of the constituencies in St. Lucia that will benefit from this pilot. And the Prime Minister pointed out the objectives of this project and we all too well know that the constituency and the communities within Castry Central and in fact in the Castries environs would benefit very much from that kind of intervention, albeit being a pilot and the lessons learned can be replicated throughout the communities in St. Lucia. So I am very heartened that the government has found it necessary to borrow to do this. Sometimes governments feel that when we spend money in the social sector, <coughs> that's money that's wasted. But I believe that the best investment we can make is in people. If we don't spend money investing in people, to make sure our youth are empowered, to make sure our children grow up to be strong, healthy, and good citizens, we would have to spend money fighting crime. And that is what has happened over the years, and that is why we have a situation in this country, and certainly in my constituency, where there, are, there is so much gang-related violence. Just this weekend, I understand, we may have had two or three homicides in or around my constituency. And Madam Speaker, the number of calls I get, the number of WhatsApps I get, every time there is another violent activity in my constituency. And if we have to solve these problems, we have to go deep. We have to deal with them on an individual, family, and community level. 
And my understanding is that pilot project seeks to do that. So my rising briefly is just to say how heartened I am as a member of parliament that this pilot project will be undertaken in my constituency, being one of the constituencies. Our youth need hope, they need empowerment, but we need to start very early. We need to start from children when they are very, very young. And it is my hope that this project will seek to do that. I would just like to encourage all the youth organizations, all the community-based organizations in the constituency to take advantage of the opportunities being presented to partner in this program. Because we know the community, we know the needs, and most often the best solution is a homegrown solution. We want the solutions to the problems to come from the community, of course, with help from others from outside who know what the best practices are. So just to say how much I welcome this project and how my office, the office of the Member of Parliament of Castle Central, we will work very closely with all agencies to ensure that we have the best outcome in this pilot so that this project and projects like these can be rolled out to prevent, to prevent crises, to build individuals, families, and communities so that what we'll do will become sustainable, not just in Castry Central, but can be replicated in St. Lucia. And we can see a reduction in the levels of crime, and we can see more productivity coming from our youth and from our citizens in general. So I wish to commend the Prime Minister and the government for bringing this here today. And thank you, Madam Speaker, for giving me the floor. Honorable members, the Honorable Member for Castries South. Thank you, Madam Speaker. Madam Speaker is actually allowing the Minister for Youth and Sports. After all, this is a youth project, or even the minister in whose ministry the project will be located to. to well, the, the, the speaker was about to close the debate, Madam Speaker, and you had started to state the question. But you will get a chance, Honorable Member, to, to then speak more. Because, Madam Speaker, the, the Honorable Member for Miko North did provide some information on the project. But there's still a lot more we'd want to know about the project, and this is an opportunity for the line ministry responsible to give even more detail than what the Prime Minister, the Prime Minister said. This was first mentioned in the budget address, Madam Speaker. And one would have hoped in the debate on the estimates, of course, you recall what happened, that the Minister of Responsibility would have taken the opportunity to provide more information on this initiative. Because, Madam Speaker, I actually rise in support of the initiative. I think, like the member for Castro Central, who shares a constituency which is similar to mine, that these initiatives are really critical. Madam Speaker, I was born in the youth movement of St. Lucia. I grew up in the youth movement in St. Lucia. And like other members on this side, member for Library, member for Denry North, member for Viewport North, we were all in the youth movement together. The member for Castries North is not here, but he was a prominent youth leader in his days. And we know what it is like for young people to be struggling and trying their best to survive in this country without engaging in any deviance or any acts which are not considered legal. And when an initiative like this is introduced by any government, I think we need to support it, Madam Speaker. We need to support it because it will give an opportunity for young people to be engaged in constructive activity. Madam Speaker, sometimes what our leader says about us tells us what they think of you. And I, and I must say, I was quite happy to hear this morning the member for Miko North indicate that we may be accepting students who are dislocated by the hurricane. We have a fine tradition. Honorable Member, I think you actually mean the Honorable Prime Minister and me, Member for Miku South. Oh, Miku South. Well, I was probably promoting somebody, Honorable Member. The Prime Minister and Member for Miku South. Thank you. And he said that we may be acting, accepting students who are dislocated 
by the damages of the, the hurricane. I was very disappointed when I heard the first statement from our Prime Minister and member from Miko South that the first offer we made was to take prisoners. I'm telling you what I heard, that we were going to be taking prisoners. And I thought to myself then, maybe we should be taking students instead. Why prisoners? And more so, why prisoners from a country that is an overseas territory of the United Kingdom? And I know in a former life as High Commissioner, Madam Speaker, one of the reasons we objected to the returning of St. Lucian nationals who were in prisons in the UK was because there was overcrowding in our prisons. Because of the state of our prisons, we could not accept them to be transferred to St. Lucia. But we are now saying to the same country, the United Kingdom, that we can actually accept prisoners and we can make space to put the prisoners. I would have said that prisoners from the overseas territories of the United Kingdom, that the United Kingdom should accept responsibility for their prisoners. And I would have offered, and I would have by now, Madam Speaker, supported an appeal for families to accept students who are dislocated. These students will be sitting common entrance and A-levels in the next few months, and they should have been the priority. And that would be in keeping with the spirit of this initiative, a focus on the young people, Madam Speaker. Madam Speaker, beyond this initiative, the ministry and the line ministries responsible for young people and sports have to show even greater responsiveness. And Madam Speaker, I want to take the opportunity to point out to you, and Madam Speaker, you may have seen when you traverse the Bannon Road, there were a number of container trailers packed on the seaside. It was decided by a particular agency that it should not be parked there. And, it was, and all the trailers were removed. And do you know where they were parked? They were taken to Goodlands Playing Field and parked on the temporary playing field that exists there. A playing field that the young people in the community of Goodlands found necessary to create because they had no place to recreate in the community. And they had a temporary playing field that they maintained and they played the cricket on. And the trailers are now parked there. And Madam Speaker, I want to use this opportunity in the House today to call on whichever agency is responsible for placing those trailer trucks on the plain area of the young people to please remove them. Because when we speak about young people and creating an environment for them to be involved in constructive activity, and Madam Speaker, when we are borrowing money to implement projects that will introduce positivity to our young people, we must ensure that there's a corresponding attitude on the actions of other line ministries. And Madam Speaker, I'm making the appeal, and I'm asking you, if you can, to use your good offices to ask whoever, whichever minister, whichever agency is responsible, to please go and remove the trailer trucks from the young people playing area. Madam Speaker, I'm looking forward to this initiative. In Fuashu, we have the Fuashu Dance Academy headed by a young man who is one of the unspoken heroes of St. Lucia. And he's doing tremendous work in that community. I want him to be able to benefit from those monies. Madam Speaker, we have throughout the constituency, in Basel, Joseph, in Marigo, young people who are involved in dance, and they too will want to benefit from this initiative. I would have preferred, Madam Speaker, that rather than spend money, money on upgrading Georgia Fifth Park, that a multipurpose court could be built in who are sure that the community center could be built in Bassa so that the young people can be involved in their arts, their culture, they would have training facilities so that they can be involved in employment creation activities. This is a welcome initiative, and I hope it gets bigger and it grows and it creates more opportunity for the young people of Goodlands, whose field has been taken away from them, the young people of Fuashu, the young people of Banan, Sisera, Madam Speaker, and Marigo and Marigo, Madam Speaker. So I'm really pleased that this has finally been announced and it will start, Madam Speaker. Because when you learn, Madam Speaker, that for the CPL we just took place in St. Lucia, information reaching me is that our government paid 450,000 US dollars to the St. Lucia Stars with a commitment to pay another 600,000 US next year for five or six matches, Madam Speaker. At both is you, but our young people in Fuashu, in Banan, in Sisera, in Monkey Tong. They need youth and sports activities. And we are borrowing a meager sum of 2.8 million US to assist them. I support it, but I appeal for more. 
for the young people of St. Lucia and Catherine South in particular. Thank you very much, man. Honorable member for Denry North. Thank you, Madam Speaker. Madam Speaker, let me state from the outset that I support the motion as presented by the Honorable Prime Minister, and that any motion brought into this Honorable House geared towards benefiting young people in this country, Madam Speaker, such a motion will always get the support of the parliamentary representative for the constituency of Denry North. Madam Speaker, permit me to preface my contribution by extending condolences, as did the Prime Minister, to the families and friends of the people who perished during the passage of Hurricane Irma. Madam Speaker, we will spare the ravages of that particular system, but sometimes when you look at what happens around you, you ask yourself, are we not creating systems of our own? But that is for another show. Madam Speaker, youth development as we know it is something that has been on the front burner of every administration for the past two, three decades. And so when the Prime Minister comes in here this morning, Madam Speaker, with yet another initiative funded by the Caribbean Development Bank to provide avenues for young people to express themselves, it is something I believe we have a collective responsibility to support, not just the people in cabinet, but even the members of parliament on the opposition side. Madam Speaker, today we are here to borrow again. And in my five to six years in this honorable house, there is no other or no activity, no proposal has generated more debate and conjecture than when it comes to borrowing. I remember when I was on the other side of the parliamentary divide, Madam Speaker, and we came here to do these procedural things, to borrow money to fund projects and to fund the budget. We were chided, we were castigated for doing so. And Madam Speaker, at the time, people who are ministers today saw it as acts of irresponsibility that we had to borrow. But if, as an opposition parliamentarian, you have a responsibility to keep abreast with what is happening in your country, you ought to concern yourself with the things that happen in constituency, yes. But you have a greater responsibility to country to know what is happening with the fiscal situation of our country. And so during the times when we came here to borrow, Madam Speaker, we had very little choice but to borrow. But at the time we were chided, we were criticized for borrowing. And today, Madam Speaker, the proverbial shoe is on the other foot, and here we are borrowing. So, Madam Speaker, whereas I support the initiative, I thought it was necessary to make that point. And I suspect given what is happening in this country today, we have only now started to borrow, and there's a lot more borrowing to be done, thereby worsening the fiscal and debt situation of our country. And so, Madam Speaker, as a responsible opposition, an opposition that has a responsibility to the people who elected us, we are going to, to watch the situation very closely. And when needs be, Madam Speaker, we will provide alternatives as we see fit. Madam Speaker, youth development cannot happen in a vacuum. And the Prime Minister made the point that this one project funded, this one project funded by the CDB will not solve all the youth development issues we have in the country. And I agree with that, Madam Speaker. And what I would hate to see, Madam Speaker, is that we approach youth development in a piecemeal fashion where we come with one particular project, notwithstanding the untold benefits that can be derived from that particular project, but that we will link it with other initiatives and that the government will come, because the government is yet to do this, Madam Speaker, after 14 months in office, to come with a plan for youth development that is holistic and that incorporates all the different projects that will be executed. Madam Speaker, prior to the meeting office in 2016, as Minister for Youth Development and Sports, at the time working with a permanent secretary who today is a minister in the cabinet. We, Madam Speaker, commissioned a review, a comprehensive review of the national youth policy. And by the time elections came, Madam Speaker, there was a draft report because we believe that the 
draft um, national youth policy of 2000, Madam Speaker, that had outlived its usefulness and that there were certain aspects of that policy that were not aligned with the prevailing realities of today's St. Lucia. But 14 months into office, Madam Speaker, not a word has been said about the draft youth policy, which we fought so hard, Madam Speaker, to commission. And we did receive support from the Commonwealth, who provided a youth policy expert. But all we've heard coming from the other side with respect to that particular policy was when on social media, there was an attempt to make St. Lucians believe that I, as minister, had appointed an assistant to the, the, the youth policy expert provided by the Commonwealth and that I had appointed the individual and pay her a salary and to use the exact words on social media, that was done so that I could siphon National Lottery's Authority money to fund my campaign. That is all we've heard about the national youth policy that is in draft form, the revised policy. And Madam Speaker, yes, there's a heavy crime prevention component, policing component to it, but we have to do a lot more. Youth development is a lot more encompassing than just those two areas. And so education is an issue. Sport is going to be an issue. And prior to leaving home this morning, Madam Speaker, or my constituency, there were a number of school-aged children loitering the streets of the Mabuya Valley and then Renoff. And most of them, Madam Speaker, or a good bit of them, Madam Speaker, are students of the Mikud Secondary School. And I heard the Minister for Education in the news trying to provide justification for the situation that arose at the Mikud Secondary School. Madam Speaker, as a parliamentary representative, as a trained educator, and as somebody who has occupied the corridors of government for some time, I found that particular excuse to be lame and unacceptable, Madam Speaker. And my reasons for this is, is, is very simple. My reasons are very simple. The Minister for Education is a parliamentary representative for the constituency of Mikuno, two-term parliamentarian. In opposition, she was the shadow minister for education, meaning that she was supposed to have been the chief custodian of all educational developments in the country on behalf of her party. She, she is into her second year, Madam Speaker, as the Minister for Education. And as I said earlier on, she's the parliamentary rep. It should not take the reopening of school for that minister, Madam Speaker, to have been made aware of the gravity of the situation at the Mikud Secondary School. So that today, Madam Speaker, as I speak in this parliament, there are children at Olio and at Richford who cannot go to school. And I was told that as recent as yesterday, something is being done. And then we come here, Madam Speaker, and we talk about youth development. It cannot be youth development in a vacuum. We have to look at all the facets, all the tentacles of youth development, and bring them together and approach youth development in a holistic way. But as I said before, Madam Speaker, I am an advocate of youth development, and any amount of resources put towards youth development in this country will always receive my support. So once again, Madam Speaker, I support the motion. I believe it is money that will be well spent, and I think it is a wise investment on the part of the government to put money in the direction of young people. Thank you, Madam Speaker. Honorable Minister for Transformation, Equity, Social Transformation. Thank you, Madam Speaker. Madam Speaker, I rise not only in support of this motion, but to welcome the move to provide the financing that is required for this motion. You would recall that in my presentation during the budget this year, I did mention this program, which will be of course, implemented by the Ministry of Equity, Social Justice and Empowerment. And then I said it would be $3.2 million. Of course, what we are borrowing here today is slightly less. Nevertheless, I think it is welcome. And uh, given what it is intended to do, we know that it is money that is going to be well spent. As a matter of fact, I consider it to be an investment. Madam Speaker, this program, the Youth Empowerment for Life Project, targets a number of communities. And while the main fo focus will be the Castries Basin, there are a number of other communities that are earmarked for interventions 
through this program. And these communities are Canaries, Mikwood, Denry, and Ancillary. Now, Madam Speaker, those communities were not arbitrarily chosen. Those communities were chosen by virtue of the situation that exists there, whether it be the incidence of crime or poverty and unemployment among our youth. Madam Speaker, as has been mentioned by the Honorable Prime Minister, there are a number of components that would be included in this program, namely a youth diversion program, and we are hoping that through that program we could do some skills training and empowerment. We have an integrated community-based program, and through that integra integrated community-based program, we are hoping that this initiative can dovetail into some of the other initiatives that we have earmarked for youth interventions. And of course, strengthening of community-based policing is another aspect, and that is also geared towards re crime reduction, as well as the design options for George V. Bar. Without, I mean, not having to say that what is already obvious, this program is geared mainly to at-risk youth and youth in the, already in the juvenile justice system. We are hoping that while some communities are targeted, that some institutions can be brought on board because I would love to see a coordinated approach taken, not just this program in isolation, but this program working in tandem with the other programs that we have earmarked for youth intervention, such as the after-school program, such as what obtains at the Boys Training Center, an institution for juveniles who are, who are at, uh, well, who have, who have gone astray and who are, have uh, violated the law. I also want to suggest that this pro project will be implemented, not again, not arbitrarily, but based on decisions that are made based on evidence. It will also be creating alternative pathways to youth crime and violence, as well as providing measures that will assist youth who have already run afoul of the law. As indicated, in our effort to alleviate crime and violence in the affected communities, we are hoping that we'll have a great measure of community involvement. And by that, I mean other agencies outside of government, such as NGOs, would be asked to partner with government and with the agencies implementing the program to ensure that that program is, in, is properly in, uh, implemented. I think of programs, Madam Speaker, such as the establishment of a center of excellence for sports, which is earmarked to, to take place at the Grosley Secondary School, as while it is in the Grosley community, it is a national program that is geared and can contribute towards the aims and objectives of this program. I say so because given what obtained in the past where we had a curriculum that was specifically bent to academics, we can now target young people who are inclined and talented in the area of sports. We also have AMAC, another institution in Angers that will be, that will be transformed to a center of excellence for the arts. And so we have young people with varying talents where we have a program, a curriculum that is not sufficiently diverse to accommodate them. And what happens very often is that those people fall through the cracks. They are considered to be failures. They are considered to be rejects. And they find themselves in the pool of, of young people who are at variance with the law, who engage in criminal activity, and uh, find themselves caught up with the juvenile justice system. So we are hoping that all of those programs working in tandem will go a long way, Madam Speaker, in ensuring that we alleviate the current situation as exists. It is not a, a case where we will have many infrastructural pro from projects coming out of this program, but I'm hoping that what already exists, like the many community centers, human resource development centers, schools, and other public buildings that are underutilized, especially in the case of schools after school hours, will be put into better use to facilitate those programs. 
Madam Speaker, the after-school program, I believe, will go a long way in contributing towards the goal of this pro program. We have other, other centers that we are looking at, like the ICT centers, where not only will young people have access to computers and the internet, but by virtue of access to, to those equipment and services, those young people can find themselves into uh, areas that will facilitate entrepreneurship. So I'm s mentioning all of this, Madam Speaker, to satisfy those who may assume that this is in isolation. It is certainly not. It is going to be working in conjunction, in collaboration, a coordinated effort geared at a holistic approach to tackling the, the situation of youth crime. As you know, Madam Speaker, this is very important to us as a young nation, given the, the fact that the, the majority of our population fall in the category of youth, given the fact that when youth find themselves in difficulty, especially when it entails crime and violence, we do not only have the victims, but even the perpetrators themselves are victims. And so if we can stem the incidence of such occurrences, Madam Speaker, I think we will go a long way in ensuring that we not only have a better society, but that we, we plan and develop and cultivate a better future, given the fact that whatever our society becomes tomorrow will be determined by what our young people are today. I thank you. Honorable Member for Beaufort North. Thank you very much, Madam Speaker. Madam Speaker, I wish to contribute to this motion, to this debate, by simply reading the first paragraph of the motion. Be it resolved that Parliament authorizes the Minister for Finance to borrow US $2.86 million from the Caribbean Development Bank Special Fund Resources, SFR, to finance the Youth Empowerment Project. I, I wish to, to reiterate, Madam Speaker, the last three words, Youth Empowerment Project, or the title, so to speak. I want to spend a few minutes, Madam Speaker, to, to talk about this. What is youth empowerment? And why, although I support financing of youth activities, why I continue to believe that the actions of this government do not indicate that they are interested in empowering youth in St. Lucia. It is very instructive, Madam Speaker, that my colleague, the member of Parliament for Castries South, had to bring to the attention of the House the fact that the actions of the Speaker seemed to be that no one would rise, and therefore she was about to pose the question, that, the, that my colleague had to call on the Minister with, with responsibility for youth. It's interesting, Madam Speaker, it would seem that debates on youth issues do not evoke the standing up and the plowing of faces that other debates evoke. And I, I can tell you, Madam Speaker, very soon you will see a lot of it. Youth, really, Madam Speaker, the cliche that the youth are the future it's, it's cliche, but it's very important. And I will take a lot of time, Madam Speaker, this morning to talk about this motion. And I can hear the comments over there. It's not, it's not the usual thing that they like to quarrel about. It's about youth. And therefore, let's finish with it. Let's do it quickly. Let's just do a little thing fast, because it's about youth. But no, I will not do it fast, Madam Speaker. I will take my time. Because every day and every month in my constituency of Beaufort North, and in St. Lucia, we experience the frustrations of young people. We see what they go through, and although government after government, every government has tried something different, we still continue to, to battle with the problems of youth. Their frustrations, their, their disappointments, 
you know, with politicians and, and leaders in the country, and the fact that their situation seems not to be given the kind of attention that is necessary. Before I continue, Madam Speaker, I wish to say that this YEP is nothing new. And the processes that got us here today started a long time ago while we were in government. And this is not to say that we are saying who started it and who didn't start it. It's simply to say that over the years, we have been doing things, and the member for Denry North said it, different governments have been doing things, they say, to address the problems of youth. So this here is not new. And I listened to the member for Gruzili and the member for, for Castries Central. And th th this is not new. I mean, we, we, and maybe that's why they're not excited about it. If you go to the web page or the website of the Caribbean Development Bank, you will see a list of all the projects, all the processes, when they started, the negotiations. I mean, all of, all of it is there. And I want to say to you, Madam Speaker, that the actions in there are common actions. We're going to try to solve crime. And I have not heard from this government any revolutionary or any new idea that will cause me to believe that they want to empower youth. I can tell you, Madam Speaker, in the year 1999, when the St. Lucia Labour Party government was in office, under the leadership of the member for Beaufort South and the then youth minister, the now Justice Michel, there was a revolutionary idea to take a, a common skills training program, a regular skills training program, and turn it into a national vibe, a national policy, a national movement to train and to develop youth in this country. And I speak of the establishment of the NSDC. That was revolutionary. The studies were done in 1999, and the NSDC was launched in 2001. And collaboration and, and, and you saw the processes. And over the years, Madam Speaker, NSDC has expanded skills training, um, retraining, all kinds of, of ideas to, to change and revolutionize the development and the empowerment of youth in this country. Ça c'était un temps côté jeune monde important. Gouvernement est garde jeune monde important. Gouvernement vient en 1997. And in 1999, the after, the government decided to change the affairs of the country. That was revolutionary. Today, I hear them trying to emasculate the NSDC, remove its strength. But we are coming to that later. Madam Speaker, the NSDC has trained thousands of young people in this country. And as I said before, that was an action to empower youth in our country. Youth, Madam Speaker, if you go to the United Nations documents, you will see youth being referred to as people between the ages of 14 to 24. In some other countries, they tell you 15 to 35. Some countries tell you 16 to 37. So there are different interpretations. And if we are talking about youth empowerment, one would have thought that the, the Prime Minister or the Minister for Youth would have taken us through and explained to the young people of this country what exactly the government wants to do for youth. What actions have the government of St. Lucia signaled or taken to give us this encouragement and to say to us, that they are really going to empower youth. And if we are going to empower youth, Madam Speaker, what is really youth empowerment? And though members opposite may 
may think we're taking too much time or they don't want to listen. I think it's important, when they hear part of young people who are listening to the, to the broadcast, to understand that parliamentarians must wake up and realize that this thing about youth is more important and more, more serious than it's being treated with. Youth empowerment, Madam Speaker, and I want to say this to preface my comments that are coming. It is a process, if you look at the, the literature from the UN and so on, many writers are indicating that it's a process where children and young people are encouraged to take charge of their lives. And they do this by addressing their situation, by they addressing their situation. And they take action to change their attitudes and their beliefs. And so everywhere you read, all of the literature indicates that it is the young people themselves who have to change. And whatever assistance we have to give to them through programs, whether it's nonprofit organizations, government organizations, schools, and so on, those programs must be tailored to them helping to change their lives. But Madam Speaker, are we, are we sure that those programs that we are speaking of will actually do that? I didn't hear the members opposite the presenter of the motion or the minister with responsibility for youth give us any indication. Where are the statistics? Has this been tried in other countries? What has happened to the programs and how can we, we tweak our programs to ensure that our youth are better off? The member for Castries Central spoke about violence and, 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 and alleged murders and so on and indicated that it is a lot of young people. And of course, we know it is the young people who are being killed and it's the young people who are, who are allegedly doing the killings. But I put it to you, Madam Speaker, we need to go deeper. The member for Gorzile said we need to go deeper. Of course we need to go deeper. I put it to you that those who, the perpetrators of the violence may well indicate to us if we dig deep enough where the violence is coming from. I feel sorry for those young people who are in this trap. And will those programs help us to identify where the violence is truly coming from? I put it to you, Madam Speaker, that those who actually strike the match for the violence, they're never the ones caught. They're never the ones who, they're never the ones besides the dead bodies when those young people are shot and so on. So I put it to you that our programs must go there. So while we are trying to empower young people, our programs must go to the bigger heads that actually start the process in the tributaries in the forest that caused the shootings to happen in those areas and in those communities. Every time I hear many parliamentarians speak, nous toujours qu'a dit commencer côté ces shootings à commencer. Oh ces jeunes monaka shoot y'en a lot. Milan y'en a lot shooting en Chimera. And we, and, and we focus there. This young man was a, a bad fellow. He was a bad man. And so on. And we always focus there. I put it to you, Madam Speaker, that in our discussions and in our programs, we have to work harder to climb those ravines, to trace the tributaries into the forest where that thing really happens. It's unfortunate, but on a political platform, sometimes, Madam Speaker, no in the port bagay delay. Even a member of parliament in Viewfort said when he wants to commit his crime, he does it by himself. Now, Madam Speaker, one may think that has no connection. But here we are talking about empowering youth, and people in the political sphere say that when they want to commit their crimes, you can favor for you. So, Madam Speaker, there are lots of Again, as I said before, when we were debating the, 
the bill on the nomination on Saturdays. It's a lot of a lot of hypocrisy. And the thing about it, especially because of information technology, the young people that we're talking about, a lot of them don't really believe a lot of the things that, that have been said. Because they live a different life. They understand the things that are happening. They know what's happening. And our focus can't just be on them. Our focus has to create the, the environment and the atmosphere to cause those young people to want to change themselves. I put it to you, Madam Speaker, that when a prime minister goes on a politi political platform and say to the people of Vuford that they come from a, they're in a ghetto and they will no longer be in a ghetto, I put it to you that this has a lot, Vuford South, I put it to you that this has, a, this has a lot to do with this bill, this motion. That's not an easy motion, you know. Mon kwe se jose bai, pwete la jose bai jen, mounen finek sa, pas nou ni po ale jodia. That's not an easy motion. The actions of the government so when you say to people that they're in a ghetto, it's a self-fulfilling prophecy that you are telling the youth that you're in the ghetto. That is very significant to me, Madam Speaker. And it's the actions of the government. If you want to empower youth, you have to give them opportunities to own land. I don't hear people talking about that. I don't hear them talking about that. So when you take away their land in Viewfort, you'll come with a little motion to get $3 million US from the CDB and say you're empowering them? Why are you empowering them? When you take away their land, how, how are you empowering them, Madam Speaker? Because you're going to take all the land, give it to one man, and then in the next 10 years, ask them to get out of Bruceville, go and rent, you'll pay them $1,000, and they have to pay rent for $800, continuing to increase the levels of the working poor in this country. You're not empowering them, Madam Speaker. You're not empowering youth by your actions. When you take away Lautier, Saki Sanu, Ukaidi Jen Munukabayo Pouvoir, again, that's a lot of talk, Madam Speaker. That's a lot of talk. Because the, the things that really empower young people are the actions that, first of all, trace where the violence and crime comes from. We don't spend too much time on it, but that is what we, we, we should be doing. So I say to you, Madam Speaker, this motion is important because it seeks funding for some programs. Some programs that are not new, programs that are happening in other countries of the region, but there's nothing there that's revolutionary to cause me to believe that this government is doing something new. The very things that the government says through their various ministers, the very things that they say, lead me to believe that their words don't really mean, you can't take their words to the bank. I point to you, Madam Speaker, the actions of this government to put hundreds of young people out of work. And you tell me now you come with something to get money to empower youth? You have put hundreds of young people out of work, age up to 35. And you say because of politics, they're a Labour Party, so they're not young anymore, they're, they're, they're Labour Party people. Who's that mate? Oh, come on, come on, come on, come on. Exodia of living the of empower you like a program. These are the real hard things that I think about. So when you come to Parliament and you say those things, I look at the reality in the communities. How do I explain to the young people who are taking care of the playing fields in Viewfort North and other places in St. Lucia? And they were feeding their families. How do I say to a young man that they, we passed, there's a bill in Parliament, a motion that will cause you to be empowered? But he says to me, but you took away my job. Not me, but the government took away my job. What will I, how will I pay to go to the training at, at wherever they have the training? But you took away my job. You took away my job. And you now come to tell me you want to empower me? Those are the real hard facts every day. Every day facts of life, Madam Speaker. 
So while I believe it's important, I do not believe in the intentions of the government. I don't believe in it. And when we come back here next year, this time, budget time, I would like to hear the report of the, from the minister. He will come to say we had this workshop and that workshop and this and that workshop. And young people are out of work. Young people are out of work. And the same money they said they didn't have. Government can't pay those things. They can't pay nice workers. They can't pay this. But they're giving tax holidays to big people who can afford all over the place. They have a lot of money. So I believe the government has a lot of money, based on what I'm seeing. I hope sincerely that the monies that will be owed to the public servants and parliamentarians because of the Salaries Review Commission, right now I realize the government has money to do all of that. So I'm waiting, Madam Speaker. I'm waiting. So I say to you, while it's important to get money for youth programs, the actions of the government do not prove that they are dead serious about youth. I say to you that the St. Lucia Labour Party in government has demonstrated revolutionary programs that benefit youth. I pointed out to you the NSDC from 1999, launched in 2001. I point out, pointed out to you thousands of people who have been trained. I pointed out to you the first short-term employment program of the labor government that saw many young people employed. I've also pointed out to you training. This is what I call revolutionary. In sports, you saw what happened. You saw what happened in cricket on the labor. And I'm not only talking about the stadium and so on. I'm talking about revolutionary programs that brought us a, the West Indies cricket captain. That's what I'm talking about, revolutionary. I'm talking about programs that brought us a gold medal at the Commonwealth, even though they try to mess it up. That's what I'm talking about. Revolutionary programs that change people. So I put it to this parliament, Madam Speaker, that we need to spend more time to talk about the youth. And don't come with a motion and try to rush and sit down quickly. You are the minister responsible for youth. Speak to the youth issues. The, the largest section of our population, when we have to talk about other things, in roads, start out I turn roads. Oh my goodness, you took me a file. But the young people, the vulnerable young people, 30 something murders. Let's not just blame them. Give me something that, search, that searches to why those murders are happening. And we know some in the, in the big halls in wherever the tributaries begin. Let's search for them. And let's not heap everything on the young people. Thank you very much. Honorable Minister for Economic Planning. Thank you, Madam Speaker. This debate, Madam Speaker, has taken a very interesting twist this morning on a matter, and I don't know how the members opposite can read the minds of members on the government side to know what we are thinking as we sat there. But I know they can read minds, Madam Speaker, because if they could read minds, they would not be saying what they were saying there. You know why? Because the youth should not be used as political pawns for the Labour Party. <laughs> Paying lip service to the youth is not enough. Madam Speaker, this motion presented was clearly in the articulated by the Prime Minister that this is going to be a pilot project tried out in a couple of areas to assess the results. What is so difficult for members opposite to understand about that? So you want us to come and make big noise Oh, we're spending two, three million US dollars on you. I'm not satisfied with that. We have to spend hundreds of millions of dollars on the youth. 
to help resolve some of the problems that we have. So as I sat down there contemplating, Madam Speaker, it is clear that they can read the minds. Because what I've heard on the other side, and I will respond to some of them, and the reason I will respond, Madam Speaker, is because some of all that is said here goes down in the record. And when you do not respond, it's not because I want to engage them in a debate on some of the foolishness I've heard there, Madam Speaker. But at the end of the day, how do you not respond to this? And, and I will take them in sequence, Madam Speaker. The member for Castries South talk about the makeshift playing field in good luck. 40 years of SLP representation of Castro South. You come in and talk about a makeshift playing field? You come in and talk about a makeshift playing field? I can tell you what happened in Goodlands. Even when I was in government and in opposition, I helped set up the temporary facility on the road going to Lindbergh inside of there for the young people of Goodlands. The Labour Party was representing there from 1997. Check how many years you all have been there. Check what? Check the condition. And then to come and make people believe that we have not done anything for the youth. So the trailers, the trailers that was causing a health, a hazard, a traffic hazard along the Millennium Highway, along the, the side of the road there, by Bananas, in the same area. And you want to talk about facilities and what happened to them? What happened to the little plain area at the back of the hospital there? So, so at the end of the day, do not come to this house and try and make the youth believe that because you all are so concerned about them, that this is why you are having this debate. You are having this debate to try and score some cheap political points. That is what this is about. This is not about interest in the youth. If you are interested in the youth, the former minister of youth, you know how much money you spent on the Marigo playing field to build? This little facility that you call the changing room, over $600,000 could build a playing field in Castry South for the young people of Goodlands. And I want you to send any quantity surveyor and value the box that you build there for $600,000 plus. Thousand dollars. And then, and then you want to come and talk about interest in the youth. So you did not know. Ada Inc. I saw Ada Inc. on this. It's there. Consultancy fees alone on this could have built a playing field next to the George Charles Secondary School for the young people of Castle South. So don't come in this honorable house. And don't pretend that you are so concerned about the youth. You are so concerned about the youth. You are minister. You talk about where's the plan. So the money, the government resources you spent to make the plan was your plan. What, what did the new government inherit in terms of the plans for youth development? Because we continue to treat ministries as if they are our personal property. So you did your plan when you were there. The new minister is supposed to do his plan. What is it he can take from your plan and continue to build on it? Because this ought to be a plan for the people. What about us politicians? Yes, if they had their own accounts, they had their own plans. I can well understand that. So, Madam Speaker, the Marigo playing field had been resurfaced under a previous project. 
and go and find out. They took sand from the Rosa Beach, which is less than a kilometer away. And find out, Madam Speaker, the money they spent to transport sand to resurface the Marigo playing field could also build a temporary facility in Castries South. So I've given you three areas where money could have been spent to build a basic facility for the young people of Castries South. So don't come here. Don't come here and try and pretend that you, and I, I heard what you said about the expenditure on, on, the, on, the, on the team, the cricket team, but I will deal with that in another forum because there's more that needs to be said. But it is amazing how you tie everything together to try and make sense out of what is happening. Where's the member for, for Viewfort North? The member for Viewfort North today is standing in parliament. I realize the Minister of Agriculture is not here. So he has taken the liberty to speak. But he should watch where I'm sitting today. So he forgot the youth in agriculture program that he inherited. Tell him go by the, on the road to his community. When we came into government, I saw stockpiles of plywood, lumber, galvanized, and steel had been sitting there for months, purchased out there in the elements, being affected. That was purchased for the youth in agriculture program. I want to ask him what happened to the youth in agriculture program. So if we're talking about empowering the youth, empowering the youth so, so if, so I don't know where I live. The Prime Minister have to come and tell me where I live. So, so you want to say, you want to tell the young people that they are living in a palace. When you know they are not living in a palace. So, who is trying to fool the young people? The first step to resolving any problem is to accept and to recognize that there's a problem. Yeah. And anybody who does not recognize that the proliferation of ghettos around St. Lucia is a problem is living in denial. And ghettos does not mean that people shoot people every day. You know different things mean different, different phrases have different connotations based on where they are used. Yes. They're quick to say I come from there, but ask them where they're living now. I live in the same place I always live. Always. I've not relocated from a child growing up. I live the same place. And I have to make the place good enough for me to live there and for other persons to want to live there. So don't come and play this cheap politics with the youth. You've had your time. You had your opportunity. And, and I want to deal more with the member for, for Viewfort North. Because I pass Rosso. He inherited, and I want you to go down there. Go and see the land. Right next to where the Windburn Research Center was. You know how many times they plowed that land when labor was in office between 2011 and 2016? At least from what I saw. They plowed the land four times. And all that continued growing there was grass. At least if we had cows in the area to eat the grass, I would have said there was some reason for allowing the grass to grow. The, the former Minister of Agriculture, member for Viewfort North, today wants to stand in this parliament and talk about youth and empowering the youth. I want him to tell me 
Where are the youth under his watch who was able to capitalize on the youth in agriculture program? There were millions of dollars from the EU for the youth in agriculture program. So were they paying their friends to plow the land every time the grass grow? And did they ever plant anything? Go, the fence is there. Everybody who drives along the, the West Coast Road knows what I'm talking about. And because it boundaries with my constituency, I was very much aware. And Madam Speaker, that's not the first time I've raised this issue in the House. I have asked him, but he will run around all other things. But the pointed questions that he needs to answer, he cannot answer. Because the member for, for um, thing gave him a fail. Member for Denry South. Gave him a fail. So he knows that he cannot speak to this. So Madam Speaker, talking about youth, I heard him talking about a revolutionary program in the NSDC. I want to ask him, and I've asked other members, and the member for Viewfort South is here, so maybe he can answer. The center at Monrepo had all the tools and everything in it as a youth center. When Labor Party came into office, whatever was going on there, there was things where you were preparing the timber, they were doing furniture, all kinds of things was happening down there. Ask them what happened to all the equipment that was there. Ask them. You talk about, because you don't necessarily have to destroy what is there to be able to do something new. Now I'm coming closer to home. There was a center in Mac, in the Crownlands area. You know what the center was used for? They were making paper products, the hotels, the different things. Ask them what happened to it under their watch. Today you want to come and present yourself as if you have an interest in the youth. I know what I do for the young people in my constituency. And the young people of Castries Southeast knows the representation that they are getting. And go and check the stats and you will see. I don't come and broadcast these things because I always try not to use the more vulnerable people in this country for political gain. And that's what we try and do, capitalize. So, oh, we care about the youth. You care about the youth? Show me your record. Show me your record on what you did for the youth. What happened? What did you do for care? What did you do for care? Care is one of the leading institutions in dealing with vulnerable youth in this country. Tell me what your track record is for care. Am I proud of my record? I'm not there yet to be proud of it. So that is why sometimes when you hear certain things, Madam Speaker, you take it in a somber mood because you understand that where we are going as a country, we are not where we want to be yet. Education. The former Prime Minister said less, about 73% of the working population is not equipped for the jobs that are available. These stats are available. But I need to remind the Labour Party, Madam Speaker, I want to remind them, out of the last 20 years in governance, they have governed 15 out of these 20 years. So it means that the child who was born in 1997 are among the youth of today. What has happened? What plan did you leave? What did we inherit in 2006 to build on? What? So solving youth problem is not an overnight. What did you do to change the education system? Being aware you are criticizing the member about the school plan. I believe the school plan is important. But more so, I believe that we need a curriculum change in the schools so that we can better equip the youth for employment. That is what we need. <coughs> so
So, Madam Speaker, oh yeah, I invest a lot in the youth, a lot more than y'all invest in the youth. I don't just want their votes. I want them to become model citizens. Give them the best opportunity to survive. And you can go and find out how many career guidance seminars I've conducted in government and in opposition. Go and find out how many programs we run in the constituency. That's not to come and boast to try and gain a vote. Because I invested in young people and education before I ever dreamed of being in government. And I've never capitalized on that opportunity to be in government. Everybody knows who you are. So they know when your talk is cheap and they know when your talk has value. So Madam Speaker, when we hear all of the things that they are talking about, Oh, they've been involved in the youth movement. You've been involved in the youth movement? What is your track record in the youth movement? To make yourself look good? To say, I've done this and I've done that? That I, I came up from this? If you came up from this, then you would have testimonials to come and show what has happened. I don't come and boast about what I've done for youth. But if you want to know, I've been a youth leader in my community from, from very young. But I don't have to come and talk about that there. Everybody knows that. The people who need to, of course, from pathfinders to master guides, you name it. Part, part of... Part of the scout movement, everything you can think of camping out there. I understand all of these things. I don't pay lip service to these things. But we need to understand. We need to understand the youth cannot be used. Yes. So, so Madam Speaker, when we look at this bill, and I can tell you, I've had several discussions with the care school. And we need, we need to build up these institutions. This business of government think that they can do it by themselves. And I know the honorable member for Castries Central was very instrumental in telling me when we came in, be sure that this program is supported. Because you know why this program is important? Because we understand our youth are vulnerable. They are. The level of maturity that we as adults have. They don't have it yet. They will get there eventually. The only problem is some of them get messed up before they realize it. So at the end of the day, yes, you can criticize us politically. And I, I can take all the criticism that you can level at me politically. But don't come and pretend that you care about the youth of St. Lucia more than we do on this side of the house. Because your track record does not show that. It doesn't. You talk about training the young people. We talk about more. We talk about better ways of employment. Do we run step? Of course we run step. But step is not our aim and our goal it is a temporary measure you came in in 1997 all you can boast about is step if i spent 15 years in government and all i can boast about is step then i should be ashamed of myself okay it should have been temporary but with this with the people on this side of the house madam speaker everything that's temporary becomes permanent you, you intro, what I didn't do? <laughs> Madam Speaker, in terms, in terms of, they, they talk about, oh, we put hundreds of young people out of work. And the jobs that are created for the young people, y'all are out there making all kinds of noise. We are creating meaningful employment that is not going to be paid indefinitely by the government of St. Lucia. That is what 
visionary leadership is about. That is what having a plan is about. We didn't come in here and try to formulate a plan. It's not after 15 years in government we say, let's form a vision plan for St. Lucia. Y'all govern for 15 years, then y'all come and try to put a vision plan together. After 15 years, we had a vision plan when we came in. And the government, the members on this side, we are working towards implementation of the vision plan. So give that thing a chance to work. You'll have your time. Five years is coming. Time does not stand still. You will have your time. So at the end of the day, Madam Speaker, when we talk about service for the youth, our education is paramount. Not just the education to know that children can write CXC. You see the amount of things I do for the, the youth? I don't go and put that on television. When you see something, it's not me that put it out there. It's some person who is impressed by what happened, and they put it out there. But at the end of the day, because I don't believe that when I help a young person to go to school, to get an education, to pay CXC or to do anything, that anybody ought to know that a politician had to pay for that person to go to school. Because you know what? This has an impact on the psyche of the young person and how their own friends view them. So I understand that. And I was doing that before I came into government. I'm not doing it because I came into government. It's just a continuation of what I used to do before I became a politician. So I want persons here to understand that this program is a meaningful program. And that is just one out of several programs being run by this government. You want to make it look like all we are doing is spending $3 million on the youth. So they are not youth cricketers in, 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 the, in the team. So, so you, feel, you feel that investing in the stars, I thought you'd be happy we were investing in the stars. But I told them, the name they changed, that's why they couldn't win a game. <laughs> they should have remained the Zooks. And I said it to them, I didn't tell them to name themselves Slambo, I tell them they should remain the Zooks. Because so, so at the end of the day, when, you know, Madam Speaker, here's the problem. Anything you do will be criticized by the opposition. And that's the problem with these members. Even if it's good, they will criticize it. You know, <laughs> Madam Speaker, of course they have to support the motion. Can they come in the house and say they don't support a youth initiative? But you see, they support on one side of their mouth, but on the other <laughs> side, they say it's something completely different. You see, with them, I know, Madam Speaker, from out of the abundance of the heart, the mouth speaker. I'm not sure where it starts with them. Yes, you should not trust it. That's very right. So, so Madam Speaker, when I had a member, a former leader of the West Indies Cricket Board, CEO, leader during the World Cup. How much money we spent to host World Cup? How many matches did we get? We spent over 80 million dollars in preparation for World Cup. Today you want to come and criticize this government for supporting a team named after St. Lucia? That gives us the prominence in the cricketing arena. And today, you come in in this honorable house. You of all persons, the member for Castro South, Madam Speaker, is the last person. They just finished boasting about making Darren Sami the captain of the West Indies. Today, who was captain of the Stars? You see, Madam Speaker, that's the inconsistency you get from this side of the house. That's the inconsistency. That's the double standards that we get from them. But today, today, Madam Speaker, 
today. The government. No, no, man. No, 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 no. That's low. Today. Today, Madam Speaker. The government. Order. Order. The Honorable Member for Castries Southeast will be heard in silence, please. I think this is getting out of control, Honorable Members. Please. <laughs> Honorable Minister for Economic Planning, please proceed. Thank you, Madam Speaker, and, and, and I'll close very soon, Madam Speaker, but it's not fair. It's not fair to the people of St. Lucia, and we cannot do these things just for cheap political points, Madam Speaker. To invest in a St. Lucia team for the CPL and to be criticized by the former CEO of the board, Madam Speaker, is really taking it to an all-time low. It's an all-time low. It's almost embarrassing, Madam Speaker, to have heard the member for Castries South, who just finished speaking about his playing field in Cast. The playing field to do what? To play cricket? So you don't expect, you don't expect that one of these days, one of these young people from Goodlands will make it to the stars team? Huh? You want to criticize us? You want to criticize us for making an investment in a team? A team that represents the name of St. Lucia? Madam Speaker, I'm passionate about that because I'm a cricket fan. I didn't start following cricket. Both. I did not start following cricket, Madam Speaker, when I got into a position. I've traveled around the region to watch West Indies play cricket long before I was in government. Big cricket fan. So at the end of the day, Madam Speaker, when I hear this, and, and Madam Speaker, why I feel that way about it is because it's done in the name of the youth. And, and what is the argument? We are for the young people. Madam Speaker, what I would love to see is the STARS team. And they think I have a problem with it being called STARS. I have no problem with that. I would love to see the St. Lucia STARS be a team that can be made of all St. Lucians if it had to be, and to be able to win the CPL. That is what I would. And this investment that the government has made in the STARS team is confidence that we are expressing in the young people of this country. But you know, Madam Speaker, they will continue to do what they think they have to do to try and win elections. But they have to wait a long time to win elections, Madam Speaker. Because the young people of this country, they know, they know, Madam Speaker, that this is a government who is going to look after the interest of the young people and the jobs we are going to create alongside the step. And when they all had step, they all were employing a hundred people in my constituency. But as the country representative, I only got to choose 25 of the workers. Today you all are crying. Now this one, on the other foot, you all crying. Why are you crying? Why are you crying? No. Tell me. Crying. Why are you crying? Oh, you, you that said it. I didn't say that. I am asking the question. Why are you crying about that? I dealt with it for five years. You know, Madam Speaker, they talk about youth. And I need to bring this in. Madam Speaker, I used to get 15 forms as the parliamentary representative for Castries Southeast, which was entitled to every parliamentarian. 
15 forms. They did not give it to me, Madam Speaker. So the students, the same young people, the children that they were talking, uh, that they want to talk about. You know what I had to do? I had to go and find the money because I was in opposition. School was opening and because that is all the parents were depending on, I had to find the money to give it to them. But I found it and I gave it to them. Because you see, Madam Speaker, you do not play politics with the education of the young people. And when you would not give 15 forms to a parliamentarian, and today I heard these parliamentarians complaining. You think I could send one person to SSDF, Madam Speaker? If they went there and they named, I'm from Castries Southeast. Even if they were Labour Party supporter, they were victimized because for thinking that they might have supported me. That is the extent to which these, these persons went, Madam Speaker. And so I am saying, Madam Speaker, don't come and pretend in this house. Be yourself. We all know who you are. If it does not have any political gain, you will not do it. That's who the Labour Party is. And if you doubt that, as the member seated next to me, Madam Speaker. He said the mad people do vote, so don't worry about them. The Labour Party! So, so, Madam Speaker, when I speak, I speak from a position of knowledge. So I know that once they cannot vote, they're not mindful about you. But the government on this side, we are caring about all of the people of St. Lucia. Whether they can vote, whether they cannot vote, whether they voted for us or they didn't vote for us. Because, Madam Speaker... That is what governance is about. And I applaud the Prime Minister for bringing in this initiative to the Parliament. And Madam Speaker, I give my full support to this initiative so that we can borrow the money and run a successful pilot project in Castry Central, which can be replicated in other places throughout St. Lucia. I thank you. Honorable Leader of the Opposition, Member for Castries East. Thank you, Madam Speaker. Madam Speaker, I did not intend to speak on this motion because I thought for once we could have agreed on something. We could have agreed that regardless of what we say, the youth situation in St. Lucia in the region is bad. Youth are at risk, there is crime, there is unemployment, and there is need for improvement. That is why every member who spoke before me supported the motion. That is why we did it. But in supporting the motion, the members sought to give the government some indication as to what was really happening as far as young people are concerned and how they could improve the situation. But the arrogance and the pompousness of this government has come, has come up all the time. Here is the, mem the member for Cassius office. Goes back to track record. Let me give you the facts, man, speak about track record. The United Workers Party were in power from 1964 to 1979. That's 15 years. The United Workers Party were in power from 2006 to 2011. That's five years. That's 20 years. The Labour Party was in power from 1997 to 2006. That is 10 years. And from 2011 to 2016, that is five years. So if you want to talk about track record and who was in power for a longer period of time, facts are the United States Party were in power longer than the Labour Party. That's an, an arithmetical fact. So when, when you're speaking about these serious issues as youth. You, you do not bring it to that level. You don't bring it to the level of trying to score cheap political points, who in power longer, track record, what he did for young people, things he did before he went for election. Mom Speaker, I have represented the constituency for about twice the amount of time as him. You understand? I didn't, I didn't win because I was... I didn't win because I was lucky. 
I won because I did things that people appreciated. So when he comes and talks about things he did before, before he was in government, that is the problem with the members of the opposite side. They do not understand that they are in government and they must do the work of the country. They must stop this blasting and this attacking and this make you cry and 90% and trying always to score cheap points when they are in government. The people elected them. Do the work of the people. Forget the opposition. Forget us. Why are you so... I mean, you, you go crazy. I mean, you spend hours discussing us. Who to do this? Who to do that? You've gone, ba you've gone back... You've gone back to, to the member for Southern Cricket, West Indies Cricket, you, all sorts of things, instead of agreeing that there are issues as far as young people are concerned, and let us try to solve it. That's all we're saying. That would, it would have been such a conducive environment. If you'd gone up and said, we know there are problems, you tried, we are trying, and we are continuing. But the point you won't, you always, and you're talking about scoring political points. You are the embodiment of scoring political points. Your whole life is, is political points. All what you say is politics. You, that's all you do. You can't change. You can't help yourself. You can't help yourself. Don't come and talk about political points and talk about this, talk about this hypocrisy about... This is, I mean, stop it, man. You, all your life is politics. You talk about these bursaries. That is not true. Madam Speaker, the 15th position is not true. The member for the last minutes of education, he came to this honorable house and he said to this member for Cassidy's office, that 15 bursaries that you did not give is not true. You were given a bursary, you refused to accept it. What he also did, I, the member for Cassidy's office was given 15 bursaries that he refused to accept. When I was Minister of Infrastructure, I wrote the Minister of his office and I told him there is a stimulus for his constituency. He refused to answer me. So you see, you, they come here and they, and they pious and they holy and endowed and they did so much things for St. Lucia and the opposition is the opposition that let us be matured and take some issues away from this halicase and this pompousness and this arrogance. Everyone pays. We are politicians. We're going to find people to criticize us. We, there are things that we cannot do. I am sure the Minister of Education, if she knew, if she knew what was the situation when it comes to repair schools, she would not have said what she said. She wasn't aware. I was in infrastructure. I know the state of the schools. We did a, a study of schools. And we found that the government needed to fix schools about $20 million. That is the reality. Because the, because the Minister of Education, when he was here, he always made a point that the, the school plant is aging. So what happens? You go and you say, they didn't allocate enough money for schools. And in the new budget, when I have my budget, I will allocate money for schools. But the reality is, you could not allocate more than $1.2 million. You know, th these are the things that you learn when you get into government and the reality of government faces you. That, that is what's happening. But you do not see them. Members don't, don't, don't want to settle down and understand that they have to run the country. They and their surrogates, every second, I am, a, I am an economic terrorist. I mean, these are the things that, that this government propagates. And you come and talk about name calling and scandalizing. Come on, let us, ra let us ra let's raise the bar in this honorable house. Anytime you open your mouth, you have, you, have, you, have, you have to attack somebody in spite of the fact that what the members are saying are things that you can take on board to help yourself to improve the situation. Because in the final analysis, all politicians, they have one day of reckoning, one day. And the day of reckoning is when the people take a line and decide who they're voting for. So relax. Just relax. You understand? So all I'm saying to you is that the youth, let us agree that the situation with the youth 
is not in a state that you want, nor I want. All of us, all of us understand that the situation of the youth should be. Honorable. So, all I'm saying, Madam Speaker, is let us take, let us bring some things away from the political divide. Let us deal with some issues up front. Let us understand that we have problems in the youth, and let's try to solve it. Thank you, Madam Speaker. Honorable Minister in the, minister, in the Office of the Prime Minister with responsibility for tourism. <clears throat> Thank you very much, Madam Speaker. Madam Speaker, I rise to give my unwavering support to this motion to borrow uh, finances to support this bill, to support this program, the Youth Empowerment Program, Madam Speaker. But Madam Speaker, before I um, begin to tell you how important this program is in my view, um, I want to take a moment to speak of its significance for my own constituency. Madam Speaker, while we have seen in recent times that we have made some improvements in the youth unemployment numbers, it is still unacceptably high. And Madam Speaker, and while we boast about you know, playing fields and lights on the various venues, and we speak about our strong interest in the youth. Madam Speaker, the fact remains is that there still remains a lack of coordinated discipline development initiatives to develop the youth in sports and other sectors that are critical to their development. <clears throat> and so while Madam Speaker, the previous Minister of Sport, likes to tell people that he spent a lot of time um, improving playing fields. But in his tenure, Madam Speaker, he has failed to implement one single national elite athlete program. And Madam Speaker, that's a fact. And Madam Speaker, we see that venue development alone cannot develop champions. And there was a boast about Darren Sami uh, by the member of Castri South because there's a particular closeness that he loves and he is very uh, close to that particular development. But Madam Speaker, instead of us boasting as a country that has um, at best three West Indies players to have represented us, one that have played just about one game, uh, then another player is in and out of the team and then we had the captain uh, for a period of time. When we, when we compare ourselves with an island like Nevis, 9,000 people, not very far, we have to ask ourselves, why have the country Nevis, just the island Nevis as part of the uh, Twin Island Federation of St. Kitts Nevis, why have they produced more West Indies players than we have? There's no national stadium in Nevis. But Madam Speaker, what there is, is that there is a committed, dedicated program towards the development of the youth. There is a consistent investment, Madam Speaker, in the running of youth development programs, in youth competitions, Madam Speaker, from the community level, from the government level. And that, Madam Speaker, has produced the results. We don't have to go far. Another OECS country, Antigua, Madam Speaker, a population smaller than the size of St. Lucia. But yet, when we look 
at the amount of legends, not just test players, but legends that they have produced. We pale in comparison. And so, Madam Speaker, the bar is very low. And I don't want us to come into this house and boast about um, little successes we've had, flashes of brilliance. Madam Speaker, we need to address the problem of sporadic development initiatives which have taken place over the years. And this is one of the things that I hope that this program address, Madam Speaker. Like the Honorable Member for Castry Southeast, I become very irate when politicians use and abuse young people with fancy language and flattery uh, narratives to try and pretend that they care about them. And then they dump them at election time. And Madam Speaker, I had an example uh, of this when I first entered politics. And I want to tell you a story that I personally encountered in the community of Jackmel, in my constituency. The same place that the Honorable Member for Viewfort South said the people wouldn't understand me when I spoke. But Madam Speaker, I went to Jackmel and the state of the playing field uh, was horrendous, was unacceptable. Madam Speaker, there were holes in the field that the safety of the players were in jeopardy. There were many instances, Madam Speaker, that there were near injuries of young men who could have injured and fractured their leg. Madam Speaker, I am very proud of a young man from Monsizo who came to me and said that he would like to start a football program. And yes, at the time I was working at Sandals. And Madam Speaker, we mobilized some funds from the private sector and we started investing in the field because the rep and the Minister of Sport, uh, the, then, the member for Denry South, were absent. No. And there are many, Denry North, sorry. And there are many requests, Madam Speaker, for an intervention proved unsuccessful. And Madam Speaker, we came, we got some of the equipment handlers in the area, we did a self help initiative. And Madam Speaker, it was very successful. We were able to bring the playing field to a level of, of acceptability where we can now play um, sport. Madam Speaker, I didn't stop there. I went and I got, again, local contractors in the area to help us with portable lights because I wanted to show the young people that they have promised. And we didn't have to wait for the installation of lights, but Madam Speaker, we ran many football tournaments, many football coaching initiatives. We brought coaches from Manchester United, from the University of the West Indies, wherever we can tap resources, Madam Speaker, to show young people that we were serious about their development. And Madam Speaker, I did so with no interest in politics. The Honorable Member for Castries uh, South, I can tell you that twice in his professional life, I asked him to join me on a program that is close to my heart, Madam Speaker, developing young cricketers across this country. And we, what were the results? You talk about track record. We saw that St. Lucia that struggled to win at the under 15 level in cricket, Madam Speaker, for about 19 years, the feat of winning uh, the Windward Islands under 15 tournament escaped us. And Madam Speaker, we saw that the under 15 team, Madam Speaker, their fortunes and their performances changed. St. Lucia consistently, Madam Speaker, began winning at the under 15 level and began winning at the under 19 level consistently, Madam Speaker. Those are results and those are private sector initiatives. And so when he was working at West Indies Cricket Board, and the board's um, image was bad, Madam Speaker, because you would recall very well that under his leadership, the entire Caribbean had risen up in uproar in the manner in which he conducted the affairs of the board. I said, well, I have a great initiative for you, which could help to restore your image and the image of the board. And Madam Speaker, I'm not lying. He's there. You can ask him. And I said, Madam come, Speaker, and we will do this Madam together. Speaker. <laughs> and, Madam Speaker, we, I asked the... Madam Speaker, on the point of order. 
34. Madam Speaker, the Honorable Member is clearly misleading the House, Madam Speaker, clearly misleading the House. And if his memory has failed him, I can probably refresh his memory for him. That there was no under 15 cricket anywhere. 35 4. 35 5. What's the improper? What is in, Where is the. the Madam Speaker, the Honorable Member is misleading the House. <laughs> well, Honorable Provide. Member, get your standing orders correct, okay, Madam please. Speaker. Please. Let us, let us get that correct, please. If you're standing on a point of order, I'm, I'm all... Let us, let us, Madam let Speaker, us get... I stand on a point of order in accordance with Standing Order 34A. And Madam Speaker, I refer to Standing Order 35.5, where the Honorable Member is imputing improper motives. The Honorable Member is misleading the House. And I just wish for the sake of clarity to, prove, to correct his account of our seemingly... Um, constructive engagement that we had in the past. Okay. Honorable, honorable Member, are you taking the correction? Madam Speaker, the Honorable Member for Castries Southeast was absolutely correct. Um, you know, some of us are wolves and some of us are sheep. Madam Speaker, I can tell you, Madam Speaker, because this is something that my family personally lived. And, and, and let me, honor, let me say this. Honorable, honorable, let honorable me, member. Yes, ma'am. Honorable minister. Yes, ma'am. Yes. There was, there was, the, 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 the issue is. The, the issue there was that the honorable member rose on a point of order saying you were imputing improper motives and the, the discourse or, or that transpired between the two of you was not what elucidated was not what he he understood it he, he it it was so i was asking you whether you took the point that he was saying or you going contrary um to what he stated now um i think um we need to to establish clear boundaries. Whilst it is permissible for us members to have the, the political back and forth, let us keep the discourse and reference to honorable members respectful at all times. Please. Well, Madam Speaker, uh, thank you so very much. But uh, I must make it clear that the Honorable Member for Castries South um, is not a real cricket fan. There was an opportunity to get a job and he took it. Now, let me explain what I mean. Because, Madam Speaker, let me explain what I mean. Let me substantiate the point. Madam, I say so, <coughs> Madam Speaker, because I say so because if he was a real cricket fan and he understood this game, he would realize that as far back as the Carib Cement Tournament, Madam Speaker, in the 90s, Madam Speaker, that there was an under-15 cricket tournament, and he needs to go back. My brother Sergio played for the Windwards in St. Lucia, and he is now 33, Madam Speaker, and he was in the under-15, at the under-15 level. He needs to check his facts, Madam Speaker, before he make pronouncements that he does not know anything about. You're and right. so, Madam Speaker, right. Right. the first, right. first under-15 cricket tournament was as far back as the 90s. Hosted, hosted by St. Lucia. Right? right, hosted by St. Lucia, the Carib Cement Cricket Tournament. Yeah. This is in the 90s. Right. Madam Speaker, what is he talking about? Right? I spent 16 years of my life developing a program. He was, direct, he was PSR Director of Youth and Sports at the time. And I asked him to join me. This was a Sandals-led initiative. It wasn't from the Ministry of Youth and Sports. You can ask the former PS for Tuna Bellrose. And you can also, Madam Speaker, when he went to West Indies Cricket Board, Madam Speaker, he was the CEO. And I said, come and join us. Let us work together in collaboration to develop this Madam program. Speaker, so I'm not here telling Madam any Speaker, lies. At this so point, I will I really not withdraw anything. On a point of order, Madam Speaker. Ma Madam Speaker. What is the point of order? The member continues to mislead the House. On the first occasion, Madam Speaker, we had an exchange. Madam Speaker, 
the, you, you sought to correct Honorable the Honorable member, member for Castry South, you are standing on a point of order. If you are standing on a point of order, I've said to all members, and I wish everyone to appreciate that and abide by the rules. When one stands, any member of this Honorable House stands on a point of order, I want you to, to first stand up and say what point of order, because I'm saying that again. If it is a point of clarification, the, uh, the Honorable Member has need not yield, which you have done so brilliantly before, Honorable Member for Castries South. Um, and so we need to know what point of order you're standing on. Because it means it is disrupting a member standing on his or her feet. What is the point of order you are standing on? Madam Speaker, the Honorable Member in his presentation is misleading the House, and therefore he is giving the House the wrong impression of an account of events which took place. And Madam Speaker, you may so rule that I should not stop him and he should proceed with his inaccurate accounts and not provide the correct information, and I accept that. Or Madam Speaker, you may wish for me to point out to him some clarification on exactly what he's saying in the course of his delivery that he is misleading the House. But Madam Speaker, I leave it up to you to, to rule, and I shall, I'm sure, find an opportunity to respond to, to the Honorable Member. Honorable members, the two, the Honorable Minister for Tourism and Member for Castry South, I do not wish this debate to go back and forth as to who recalls what of the conversation, so let us kindly move away from that conversation as to what transpired and the discourse or the engagement. Um, between the two of you. Is that okay? Can we move on? In terms of making reference constantly to some to um, a relationship or, or, or engagements or exchanges between the two of you, because it goes back and forth to your account, your account, Honorable Minister, is not his, what he recalls as his account. So let us avoid wasting time on that that issue and move on and stick to your 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 point and carry on please madam speaker um with your permission i would just like to make one single point on this particular matter because what has happened here madam speaker is the honorable member has accused me of attempting to mislead the house but I have an echo. Is your phone on close by or something? So, so Madam Speaker, I'm just going to ask one final question, because if the honorable member has accused me 
of misleading the House, then, Madam Speaker, my own reputation and integrity is at stake. And I would like to ask your permission, Madam Speaker, to defend myself. So, Madam Speaker, I promise you I will not take more than five minutes. But one single question I would like to ask the Honorable Member for Castro South. Through you, Madam Speaker, is if the program was not started by the private sector partner, why does it still exist? And why does the why does the West Indies Cricket Board why aren't they no longer involved? Why is that? If he wasn't invited to participate, as I've said, which is a matter of fact, and Madam Speaker, I will present to you a documentary with the then CEO of the WICB speaking on the matter, right? And you will see the context in which he spoke. If you want, I can make those issues a document of the House by video. It's right here. Uh, Madam Speaker, as well, I can present to this House a copy of a concept paper which was written by me and sent to the then CEO of the WICB, Madam Speaker, asking for the collaboration. And Madam Speaker, I am not here to try and mislead the House, but I'm here to make one single point. When it comes to youth development, we must not play politics and we must not pretend like we are champions of the youth when all we do, Madam Speaker, is to attempt to score cheap political points. And that was the point that I'm getting to. And that's what we're seeing here today, Madam Speaker. This is why this program is so important. And so, Madam Speaker, it is clear, the facts are clear, he does not even know about under 15 cricket. Madam Speaker, check the records. Carib Cement was the first tournament. And it started in the 1990s, St. Lucia hosted it, my brother participated. But yet, the honorable member is saying that there was no West Indies cricket. A former CEO of the WICB doesn't know this. He's not real. So, Madam Speaker, I'm going to move on. I'm going to move on, Madam Speaker. And I would like, but you can answer what you want, but you answer with the facts. And you know, Madam Speaker, they've asked us to leave the opposition alone. But how can you leave an opposition, the, your leader, you're the man you're trying to challenge? The, how, could you, how could you leave an opposition alone, Madam Speaker? How could you leave an opposition alone that all they try to do is disrupt and cause chaos and create a scare tactic and do all that stuff? Yeah, don't worry yourself, I'm leaving you for your friend. I'm not bothering with you. Right? We cannot leave them alone. Look at their attitude today. They wouldn't allow us, Madam Speaker, to make our presentations in the House. Madam Speaker, we, must, we, we have to respond appropriately to the lies and the rumors and all of the, uh, the things that they're doing on Facebook. But back to the substantive matter of the Youth Empowerment Project. And Madam Speaker, the point I want to make is that this project is not in isolation. The government has said and has announced more initiatives, Madam Speaker, like the National Apprenticeship Initiative, which, Madam Speaker, will expose our young people to a whole new field, Madam Speaker, which will give them opportunities to work in industries like technology and, and, and tourism, Madam Speaker, so that our young people, Madam Speaker, will have more opportunities than they did in the Youth and Agriculture Project. And Madam Speaker, that's a project that's dear to my heart as well, because I'm from a, an agricultural constituency. And what was quite noticeable about the contribution from the member for Viewfort North is that he spoke about all other projects. He spoke about education, he spoke about sports, he spoke about all kinds of different things. You would have thought that he served as the Minister of Sport, you would have thought that he was a Minister of Education, but he failed, Madam Speaker, to speak of the single project that his ministry, while he was Minister, presided over and took the lead on that related to the youth. And that is, Madam Speaker, the now failed Youth in Agriculture project. Madam Speaker, when I drove past the uh, Roseau Highway and I look at the tall grass, I thought that someone was doing a reforestation project. But then they pointed out to me that it was an agricultural project. 
But I really thought, um, Honorable Member for Castries Southeast, that it was reforestation. So what I began doing, I commended the government, the at the time government, because I thought that here are we doing a climate change initiative to um, address you know, this rather global situation. But to my surprise, it was actually a youth in agriculture project. And, and so the Honorable Member for Viewfort North, when he talks about the youth, you are not serious, my friend, about the youth. Because the one project you had to use uh, technology to bring in new mines uh, into the agricultural sector, to infuse a new interest in the young people in the agricultural sector, you have failed to do it. So how do you then want to come and preach about how we should develop young people? You have failed. When you had your turn, you failed. So give us a chance. It's only been 14 months. Wait and you will see what is going to happen, the type of transformation that will take place in the youth and agriculture um, sector. And your minister, your successor will be back and he will unveil to you the real youth and agriculture program. So, Madam Speaker, much noise was made about the, the problems, the issues, the challenges we face in education, as if the minister, the new minister of education uh, inherited these problems today. I mean, the Mikud Secondary School, it is a, a, a symptom, it's, it's a result of years of, of neglect. Years of neglect. It didn't just happen. She didn't just wake up overnight and all of a sudden the school uh, is dilapidated in the space of a year and a half, a, a year and a couple months. No, that's not what happened, honorable members. It is years of neglect. But you know, I have one simple fact. And I have a little, I drew a little table for myself. And I went back to, and you know, I want to go back to history like my friend from Castri Southeast. What he did, so, South, Castri's uh, East, whose constituency, by the way, is benefiting from the program. And Madam Speaker, he gave us this convenient chronology of history, of political history in St. Lucia, and came from uh, 1964 and ended up at 19, 1997. But Madam Speaker, failed to address the destruction that was caused to this country between 1979 and 1982. Ma Madam Speaker, the, the devastation, the retrograde step, the dysfunction, the broken society that St. Lucia was, Madam Speaker, in those short three years. Madam Speaker, he has failed to address them conveniently, but he says the UWP was in power for 30 years, and SLP was only in power for 15 years. Now, my God, from 1997 to uh, the year 2017. In these 21 years, Madam Speaker, the SLP presided over the government for 15 years. Madam Speaker, this administration was there for six years. What is wrong with this obscured history that we are hearing that, you know, all of a sudden, all of the problems of the country is as a result of the UWP? Madam Speaker, they had two terms of a supreme majority in the parliament and failed to transform this nation and didn't have the courage, Madam Speaker, to take some of the bold steps necessary to transform our society so that St. Lucia can become ready as a robust society to take on the challenges that will face a small island developing state in the 21st century. That is the opportunity you had and you blew it. So how do you then want to come and give us this convenient history? Like we woke up on uh, June uh, the 7th of 2016, and then all of a sudden, all of these things happened in St. Lucia. They just happened uh, overnight. How, how do you do that? And so how can we leave you alone? We have to respond to the various uh, inaccuracies and erroneous statements that you're all making all over the place, trying to fool people about the different attempts by the government to develop this country and develop the young people. And so I will not rest. I will always tell you like it is, and I will call you out whenever I see that something is, is not going well in the narratives. I mean, I looked at the, 
rumor, and I heard your statement. Um, but what you didn't tell them is that you're a Butch's friend as well. Very close to Butch. <laughs> but that is for another show. I'm waiting for you. I am waiting for you because I know, I know what you know. <laughs> I'm coming for you, so you better be careful. But, but Madam Speaker, Madam Speaker. Honorable members, I think this is now out of order. Please. Madam Speaker. How can we, Madam Speaker, forget them when they are there trying to destroy this country? How can we? We cannot. And I will deal with all of the lies and all of the erroneous statements. Madam Speaker, the latest rumor they said was, um, and you know, in, in that they, they, they're, they're operatives on Facebook, that the chairperson of the board resigned. I mean, there's, where do you guys get off? Then the latest posting is that somehow there was a deal reached and we, we had to pay her monies to stay quiet. This is destructive. We believe in freedom of the speech. We believe that, that, that journalists should ask any questions. But you have an obligation to be responsible. We believe that. We did not coin the phrase media terrorists. And, and if you check the history of the UWP as a party, right, we have very few lawsuits against journalists. Look back. Listen, the last, the last, the last journalist, Madam Speaker, who picked up something from the internet and read it, and and the word, Ma Madam Speaker, the the the, the commentary from uh, the very popular um, Caribbean news network just said and reference well-known sex offenders madam speaker it said there were four government ministers of the previous administration who took strong umbrage by the statement and wrote madam speaker the journalists lawyers letters madam speaker you want to talk about intimidating the press uh, one of their well-known hacks on on uh, one of the famous talk shows wrote a letter to the poor journalist madam speaker Call his boss to threaten his job. And you all fellas want to talk about press freedom? Ah, shameful, man. So, so Madam Speaker, the Honorable um, Members. Honorable, honorable Member. The, on, <laughs> the, <laughs> Madam Speaker, the Honorable, honorable Member. Honorable Member. Yeah. I think no matter how you take it and you turn it and you twist it, it is unparliamentary language. And honorable member, honorable minister, I wish you to withdraw it. The we, you fellas, please, it is unparliamentary. Let us not get down to that level in this house. So, Madam Speaker, I'm always going to um, heed to your... Uh, honorable member, yes, you are to withdraw. You have been so directed. Yes, madam, that's what I'm doing. I, I'm, madam Speaker, I'm redrawing the reference of, of the word fellas. Thank you. Yes. So the honorable members, madam Speaker, cannot be left alone. Because if they are left alone, madam Speaker, they will fool a lot of people. They will continue with a lot of desperate attempts at, at misleading the people of St. Lucia. And madam Speaker, the, the youth of this country, they are in a state of hopelessness. Madam Speaker, they need uh, inspiration, Madam Speaker. They need motivation. They need a government that will invest in them. They need programs such as the initiatives that are contained within the Youth Empowerment Program, Madam Speaker, in order for us to begin to address their plight. And Madam Speaker, the STEP program will not do it. And the NICE program, Madam Speaker, has failed to do it. Madam Speaker, what the honorable members, the members on the side opposite, would like young people to do is to continue depending on them. And you can see it based on the programs that they construct, and they call them youth empowerment. <coughs> but these programs, Madam Speaker, turn our young people into mendicants. They turn them into people that depend on politicians. And so, Madam Speaker, I am not one of those politicians that believe that you should design programs 
so that young people remain dependent. But Madam Speaker, rather we must build their capacity, such as this program is attempting to do, so that we can rise them to the next level and we can make the young people of St. Lucia among the very best in the Caribbean and among the best in the world in small island developing state. And that's what this program is attempting to do, Madam Speaker. It is focusing on constituencies like mine. Constituencies, Madam Speaker, that, that has very uh, high levels of, of social uh, challenges and malaise. And so, Madam Speaker, I want to commend uh, my, my colleague, the Honorable Member for, for Grosley and the Minister that is taking the lead in this project um, on this initiative. And I want to let him know that the young people of Ancillary and Canaries constituency um, are excited and looking forward to the benefits that will be derived from this program. Madam Speaker, I thank you. Honorable Member for Labrie. Thank you very much, Madam Speaker. Madam Speaker, I rise to support the motion before this House to borrow approximately $2.86 million to finance the Youth Empowerment Project. Madam Speaker, I align myself with the interventions of my colleagues who have spoken before me because they were correct when they said that if we have to be successful in our quest to improve the lot of young people, we must tackle inequality and social exclusion. And in this regard, Madam Speaker, I would like to refer to an OAS publication in 2011, Inequality and Social Inclusion in the Americas on page 89, and I quote, Poverty is by far the main underlying cause of social exclusion and inequality and has a direct impact economically, socially, and culturally speaking. However, inequality is not a consequence of income disparity alone. Determinants also include lack of opportunities and a practical inability to exercise certain rights or influence decisions on key issues that affect the quality of life of individuals, the family, and social groups. One of the most frequently violated rights in this situation is access to justice on equal terms. Although a range of different factors, some of them structural, affect the general population when it comes to obtaining prompt and effective justice, the situation is far more dramatic for people living in poverty with neither the financial means nor the basic knowledge to uphold their rights through the bodies responsible for dispensing <coughs> justice, in turn making them vulnerable. Even those who do not succeed in having their day in court use up a larger percent of their overall wealth in the attempt. Sometimes doing so can undermine the ability to satisfy all the basic needs so often they decide not to seek justice or exercise that right in full. This is particularly serious because access to justice is the basic tool available for people to ensure that all the rights recognized by international instruments and domestic laws are protected by the relevant mechanisms essentially through efficient, impartial, accessible systems for delivering justice whether judicial, extrajudicial, or administrative in nature. There is little point in a state formally recognizing a right if the holder of the right cannot obtain effective access to justice in a prompt and timely manner to safeguard it." Unquote. Madam Speaker, whilst we speak about addressing the causes and consequences of poverty, and crime, we must pay attention to the plight of the vulnerable in this country. Poor people are always at a disadvantage in accessing justice. 
and even sometimes to get an inheritance because they are in no position to effectively challenge in court that it is taken away from them and they are caught they are locked in generational poverty so poverty moves from one generation to the next the member for Caswe South was right. Most of the members on this side of the house would not allow a motion like that to pass without comment because we, most of us were immersed in community development. We were largely foremost in fostering the birth and initial dynamics of the St. Lucia National Youth Council that organized youth all over this country, whilst the United Workers' Party at the time did not recognize and what war. But that's for another show. I am very pleased, Madam Speaker, to indicate that the Labour Party, when in office, always endeavour to deliver to the young people of this country. At a certain time, at a certain period in our history, only the rich and affluent could have access education at higher levels. When the Labour Party got into office, we made bursaries available. We made scholarships available. We made uniforms available. We assisted poor people in accessing poverty at all levels. So we are not paying lip service to the business of young people. We were the ones who built the national stadium and a new cricket ground to introduce a new sporting culture so that we can augment our tourism plant. We were the ones, Madam Speaker, who came up with NICE to provide employment for young people. When more people are employed, more people can make an effective demand for goods and services in the country, thereby contributing to economic growth. Young people were packed like sardines, similar to when the slave ships used to come from Africa to the Caribbean. In a prison, the prisoners were breaking away easily then we moved to some makeshift prison at Odsa, where people were liming and going in and out as if it's a hotel. And I remember my predecessor in this house indicating many times, show me a prison and I'll show you the level of your civilization. We built a new prison to make sure that young people were not condemned to death, but rather find an environment that at least while they're waiting for justice in this particular matter. Madam Speaker, this is why, as part of our urban renewal postures, we decided to build the Derek Walcott House. That project was intended to address the causes and consequences of poverty and try to reduce crime in the city by providing a better environment for our young people, that the, our city would become a theater for serious development, to keep our culture alive. Any policy without a soul is lost. And you go to any society that is progressive, the arts breathe new life into the twin nostrils of social and economic policy. There is no doubt about it, Madam Speaker. So Madam Speaker, when we come to this Honorable House, and I hear members opposite saying, oh, you all pay lip service, to the business of you. Irrespective of which government that occupies the corridors of power, we spend a substantial amount of monies on young people in this country, whether it's education, youth and sports, garbage collection, every single thing we spend on young people in the country. When we stand in this house and decide to say that the opposition is not investing in young people, and you all are the ones investing in young people, we are giving them the impression that somehow we are not utilizing the resources that we have to promote the development of young people. We must reflect in our discourse in this honorable house the patent limitations that we have in terms of the amount of resources we have to invest. I am sure if resources were not limited, we would have never gotten out of office because everything we promised we could have delivered. But that's not the reality. That's not the reality. So when we come here and we just speak, we just say things, vitivi, vai. say to people that the opposition was making $6.80 and we were burdening the poor people. So when we came to budget time, we should have moved from $6.80 to $4, not from $2.50 to $4.
Now, these are the kind of lies that is just not good for the development of the country. Let us have some more responsible discussions in this honorable house. Every member on this side, when they spoke, indicated that they support the motion to borrow. The member for Kaswi South even indicated that it was inadequate. And we understand we have competing priorities. So let us speak to young people in a, in a more responsible way to say to them that we have $100 million available. This is how the Labour Party is spending it, and this is how we are going to spend it to create a better environment for you. I don't think that they're up to that type of debate. They're not up to that challenge. We must elevate that the standard of debate here where the resources of our country is concerned. We cannot continue that path of attacking each other. This is why I have stated on platform and anywhere that I speak on politics, I am not one who's motivated to attack politicians. Everybody say, you know, politicians are not good and all politicians are the same. This house contained persons who came from the general society, a microcosm of the St. Lucian society. Whatever is in the society is present in this house. You find good people in the society. You find bad people in the society. You find all types in the society and in your parliament, it will be reflective of the society that we have. But I know the realities that surround us as politicians, the kind of horrors that we face. Nobody in this country, nobody go through it. But yet still, we come here and we behave as if when we're on this side, we are lords and gods and we know it all. And when the opposition speaks responsibly to a particular motion or a particular bill, it's always some abuse and always some unnecessary attack. We support the motion, Madam Speaker, and we are saying on this side that we do not pay lip service to youth development. We have been involved and we are going to continue to commit ourselves to the development of young people. And in closing, I want to say, had we been in office, we would not have destroyed the NICE program. We, have, we would not have adulterated any program we are put in place. In fact, the Labour Party has been criticized by the United Workers' Party because it invests so heavily in social programs. Obviously, this is not the priority of the United Workers' Party administration, even though they speak about social issues and social programs. Had we been in office, Madam Speaker, we would have built on what we left in the past term. And I just want to read from our top 15 pledges to you. I have made this a document in the House before. And I just want to quote um, four sections from it. We will assist payments, um, parents in meeting the cost of the fees for CXC exams. We will transform the Safa Lewis Community College into a university college with full degree granting status. We will rejuvenate the city of Kasseris, restoring it to its former status as the most attractive city in the Eastern Caribbean. And I spoke to the Derek Walcott project. And finally, we will completely transform the agricultural sector focusing on new value-added products like nutraceuticals and organics, unquote. All of this to involve young people in the economic realities that surround us, to give them access to opportunities that they did not have before, Madam Speaker. And so let us not go down that route again. I'm not in the mood to en enter some full-scale assault on the postures of the United Workers' Party and of course, to go overboard in accentuating what we have done for young people in this country. So I'm hoping that next time we come to this house and we debate policies like this, we do it with class. We do it with a certain calmness and a certain professionalism that will ensure that we improve upon what we found, Madam Speaker. I thank you, Madam Speaker. Honorable Minister for Education and Member for Miko North. Thank you, Madam Speaker. I rise to support the motion under consideration here to authorize the Minister for Finance to borrow U.S. $2.8 million from the Caribbean Development Bank to finance the Youth Empowerment Project. Madam Speaker, I heard 
the Prime Minister and member for Miku South very clearly when in his preamble he intimated that this was not the sum total of the intervention of this administration as it pertains to youth and the issues that confront the youth of this country. It is with that in mind, Madam Speaker, I feel compelled to reference not only the project which will be financed by the monies to be borrowed, but the partnership among sister agencies to ensure what we call a wraparound intervention or holistic intervention. And whereas there are certain constituencies that have been earmarked for this particular project, the people of St. Lucia ought to know that other agencies and their constituents in effect will also benefit. Madam Speaker, increasingly the conversation has been about implementing positive behavior for learning and for youth development. Too very often we wait when things have festered beyond the point of correction to consider punitive measures. This is one such intervention that seeks to prevent, that seeks to intervene, intervene early enough so that we do not see problems that affect our youth festering into bigger issues with greater social and economic impact. And that is why the behavior modification component is critical. Because as with any given society, we do have children who display some kind of behavioral disorder who unfortunately we are sometimes forced to suspend. I do not subscribe to that approach and that is why we are continuing internally to adopt positive behavioral modification options. Madam Speaker, the sum total of that intervention is to reduce unproductive and challenging behavior, to give additional assistance to embellish learning and support needs. Madam Speaker, and that is not a standalone kind of intervention. The phraseology that I heard the CDB use in one of the consultations was that of a wraparound approach to mean that we recognize that the child belongs to a family, lives in a particular neighborhood, is confronted with certain social, economic, and psychological challenges, and that these must all be treated with in turn so as to bring about the comprehensive fix or corrective behavior that we seek. With respect to responding to some of the economic problems that could inform or lead to the social problems, we have at the Ministry of Education partnered not only with uh, my sister agency in the, in the entity of the Ministry for Equity, but we're also working with other agencies such as USAID. And the intention is always to ensure that we present the best options and the best opportunities to our young people. Perhaps the public is not fully aware that in the last couple months and preceding the reopening of school, we have increased the number of bursaries given to students, and each parliamentarian in here knows that whereas previously we each received about 15 bursaries, this year we were able to near double that number. We have also increased the allocation for school transportation and uh, Madam Speaker, for the school feeding program as well. And these interventions are critical 
to the extent that they add up to our efforts to deal with the prob problems, the social and economic problems that our youth are confronted with in a comprehensive way. During the summer too, we employed resources to host a college readiness symposium and a career readiness program. And that intervention was to expose young school leavers to the opportunities available for study and for work, not only within the region, region but also internationally. But more importantly, to encourage them to seek out opportunities where they can secure scholarships based on their sheer brilliance. And that notwithstanding the fact that we continue to lobby our friends in the international community to provide more scholarship opportunities for our young people. And we see, for example, Monroe College increasing the number of scholarships available and the active engagement with our donor agencies to ensure that the scholarships are offered in areas of need given the evolution of our economy, that there's a greater focus on green and blue professions, all in keeping with our own commitment to climate action as well. Madam Speaker, the intervention on youth or the assistance that we lend to our young people is comprehensive and I like to say from the womb onward and that is why we are undergoing a thorough revision of our early childhood education system. It is indeed the foundation of our education system and if the foundation is weak nothing else can stand comfortably on it. Also, Madam Speaker, and some people perhaps are not as sympathetic or compassionate as they ought to be regarding the affairs of students who are differently abled or with special needs. Now that we have a new Denry Infant School, we are working in partnership with private sector entities to see how best we can retrofit what is now the old Denry Infant School to accommodate students along the East Coast with challenges, with learning difficulties, so we can cater to every child and indeed every child will and indeed every child will be attended to and no child will be left behind. Madam Speaker, over the summer, we partnered with an NGO called We Are the Oceans. And that intervention was rather curious to the extent that it showed what can be achieved when we marry our efforts. Because we recognize all too well the fiscal constraints that we have in this economy. And I always tell my colleagues, I always tell my team, whereas for some kind of egotistical reason, agencies are trying to change the world with their five cents, if only we would all marry our resources, perhaps we could realize the kind of paradigmatic shift that we need to take place in our economy. We hosted a summer camp, again, a preliminary case study pilot program which will be rolled out to other communities where young children using technology were able to study the ocean, study the impact of garbage disposal on the ocean and make documentaries. I'm talking about kids between the ages of 7 and 16. Madam Speaker, that same age group benefited from an innovation and science camp which was hosted by the Department of Sustainable Development, again endeavoring to build capacity to harness the talents within our youth. All these interventions, and we can go on. I have not yet mentioned the, the, the centers of excellence that we are working on, so as to offer greater diversity, greater choice to our students who perhaps have different kinds of affinities. 
We have not spoken about that yet. We have not spoken about what we're doing with creative arts or with sports. And even very, very, very importantly, I know, Madam Speaker, much has been said about the laptops. Let me say what we have done with respect to enhancing e-skills and digital literacy in this jurisdiction. That we have introduced a course called Digital Literacy that will be rolled out, or as of this year, has been rolled out in our secondary schools to ensure that our children are exposed to a curriculum which will enhance their e-skills. And we do that even while we continue to work with entities such as CARSIP and the NTRC to expand bandwidth in school and to consider building some more, or fitting more schools with IT labs so that all kids, not just third formers, that all kids have access. Further, now that we have, under the Ministry of Education, responsibility for what used to be called the ICT access uh, centers, these where they are in close proximity to schools will be considered for active timetabling which means that they can be used as an additional classroom where IT courses can be offered. So I'm saying all of this to make sense and to give greater clarity to the Prime Minister's preamble, which is that this intervention, we recognize, is not a standalone intervention, and nor is it sufficient, but in tandem with the other things that we're doing will bring about that kind of empowerment, that kind of capacity building that we want to see in our youth. And uh, it is not. And I insist, it is not. This is only the second year of our term. This is not politicking. This is simply saying what we have done in the past 14 months and what we will continue to do. And I need to give every St. Lucian the assurance that we in this house are all agreed that the resources available for school repairs and for school are inadequate. We are equally agreed that given the demands on the public purse, we will have to be more innovative when deciding and determining which areas we give priority because no child will be left behind as we continue as a government to build a new St. Lucia. Let the record show that I support this motion and I support what the Prime Minister and my colleagues we are doing working together, marrying resources and programs to bring about that empowerment and to build capacity in our youth. Thank you. Honorable Minister for, with responsibility for sports and member for Denry South. Thank you, Madam Speaker. Madam Speaker, as I stand to lend support for this resolution as presented by the Honorable Prime Minister, let me see off the bat that my standing here this, this afternoon is not prompted by anybody. And I need to say to of the bat too that it is not about grandstanding. It is not about boasting. I mean generally anybody who knows Edmund Stefan knows that he is action oriented. 
not boastful, but bashful. And let me also say, Madam Speaker, that I say all of this in the context that I'm never afraid. Never afraid of being outnumbered too because a lion walks alone while sheep flock together. So in this context, Madam Speaker, let me again stand here and support the resolution as presented by the Prime Minister. But Madam Speaker, a lot has been said about sports and youth development in St. Lucia. And I know that a lot would have been put in context and would have been placed on record during the last debate. Suffice it to say, there was, and we all know, there was so much gamesmanship during that process that it had to be cut short. But Madam Speaker, this government is about empowering people. This government is about creating sustainable jobs for the young people of this country. And when it comes to this aspect, when it comes to dealing with young people, foremost in my mind is job creation. Now, you cannot deal with job creation in a vacuum. It is not a standalone thing for you to create jobs in the for your people and for your young people, you have to first grow the economy. And this is the most important aspect. But that in itself too cannot stand in a vacuum. There are so many things that has to be done. There are so many little things that has to be done. And when everything is put together, then you'd have been creating sustainable jobs for your young people to get them out of poverty, to get St. Lucians out of poverty, to get communities out of poverty, to get families out of poverty, Madam Speaker, to get this nation out of poverty. And even as we presented our case to the St. Lucian people during the last general election, one of the things that I championed was that sports and youth was not being dealt in the correct way. And today, let me see if I can put that in, into context and let me tell you, Madam Speaker, some of the things that we will do to try and achieve our objective, to try and achieve our goals, to try and make St. Lucia prosper, to try and get our young people out of the gutters to try and get them to be productive, to try and get them to be able to provide for their families, to try and get them, Madam Speaker, to get out of the malaise, to try and prevent them from going into illicit activities. Madam Speaker, we have to be very, very passionate about that because we know that over the years, we know that for decades, we have had issues and problems that have persisted. And now it is getting more and more difficult. Why? Because one of the reasons is that politicians don't cooperate. It's one of the reasons. One of the reasons is that of philosophy and as I talk about philosophy, let me talk about the United Workers Party philosophy, which is the, the Labour Party's philosophy, when it comes to politics in this country. Madam Speaker, 
in my humble opinion. In my humble opinion, I came into politics because I had to choose between two parties to find out where is the best place to put what, whatever little I have in my head. Where is the best place that I can channel what I have in my head so that it can benefit the people of this country? And I know I've been there for a little while. I wish that a lot more could have been done. But at the end of the day, Madam Speaker, it is what it is. Life goes on. And now, as Minister of Youth Development and Sports, what needs to be done will be done. It, it doesn't matter how long it will take. Okay? But it has to be done and it has to be done correctly. So, Madam Speaker, the Labour Party believes in creating an, a dependent state. Creating people who just depend on them for this and depend on, depend on them for that and depend on them for this. That is not how the United Workers Party functions. The United Workers Party is about the empowerment of people, especially of young people. And so, Madam Speaker, I'm fully aware that some of the programs and policies and actions that this, this government is undertaken is for the betterment of this country. A lot of the things that we are doing, a lot of the things that we'll, we will do, a lot of the things that we have not even announced. Okay? Because don't forget that we are not boastful. We take our time, we plan properly. I do. And then we execute. So, Madam Speaker, we are about empowering people and especially empowering the youth because we want to force the change. Okay? And I will repeat myself, we want to eradicate poverty in this country. When, when one person in your country is poor, or when one family is poor, or when one constituency is poor, it affects your entire nation. Okay? Because we're supposed to live together. We have families that cross borders. Okay? One family is in, one person out of a family lives in Ancillary, another lives in Denry. Okay? They might be brothers and sisters. When one, the person in Ancillary is suffering, it affects the person in Denry. So, Madam Speaker, we need to be careful and we need to build and construct our country right. So, Madam Speaker, I have always wished to become the Minister of Youth Development and Sports. That's a, that's, a, that's a life goal. Why? That's not about myself. I don't want to become Minister of Youth Development and Sports for myself. Okay? For me to go out there and for me to boast or for me to make noise. Okay? I realize, Madam Speaker, that the only way to foster change in our society is to get to be the head and to direct as best as you can. And that is one of the, the one of the reasons I went politics in this country. I didn't have to do that. I could have been somewhere in a stadium in Beaufort coaching people to run, coaching sprinters, making sprinters for St. Lucia. But our structure in this country didn't allow for that. And so here I am. The, the direction has to be something different. Okay? And so, Madam Speaker, at the Ministry of Youth Development or at the Department of Youth Development and Sports, change has to be fostered. Change has to come. Okay? We have to find and do what is right so that society can change. And so, Madam Speaker, let me mention a few things that must be done in order for this to happen. And the Minister of Education spoke of it. It's about capacity building. A lot of our institutions in St. Lucia, when it comes to sports, they, we need to improve on, on, on the capacities. So, for example, 
at the, at the Department of Youth and Sports, we are trying our best to improve on the capacity. Okay? Although I have a fundamental issue with the structure, I have a fundamental issue with the structure of the civil service, I have a fundamental issue with the structure of the teaching service, but there is little I might be able to do when it comes to that, except try as much as possible to improve on the capacities as they exist. And so, Madam Speaker, number one priority, we change the structure at the department. Okay? Now, so now that we have a dedicated officer or dedicated director for youth and a dedicated director for sports, things should work better for the development of sports in our country and for the development of youth. And this has been, okay, this has happened. We have changed the structure for the better. And now we are looking. We will have a lot of begging to do. We have a lot of begging to do so that we can in increase capacity at the department. But it is necessary. Um, I jokingly, I jokingly tell a few of my friends, you know, if you look at the system of governance in the United States, this is what we have. You know, at our level, let's say at the, at the minister's level, the persons who serve with us, they should be implementing even the policies that you think of. And this is actually happening in certain jurisdictions. Okay? By the time, let's say, the mayor or whoever gives his speech somewhere and he outlines his policies, his technocrats are down trying to figure out ways of implementation. Okay? But our system is broken. We do not have this. But we have to work very, very diligently to try and achieve that. So the structure we're trying to improve. And let me just give an, another example as I, as I use structure, Madam Speaker. Because that's very important. If you, take, if you take the education system, and I will just use one example. You have someone who is very passionate, at, let's say, about kindergarten. And this person decides that, okay, they're going to be a kindergarten teacher. Okay? So the person has a good start, maybe coming out of A-level or from secondary school. And then the person wants to build a home. The person has a family and so on and so forth. But whatever little salary they get it down there is too meager. So what do you think that person has to do? Or the system might provide that the person continue educating themselves. But you know in our system, after that person has, let's say, obtained a degree or a master's degree or, or a doctorate, for them to get a salary increase, they have to live wherever they are and find space somewhere else, okay? Going away from their passion and putting and leaving our children at risk, okay? So this is what I talk about when I say that's an example of a bad structure, okay? It should be that at a level like this, that you should be able to, if you become a doctor, stay and prepare the kindergartens and teach them and, 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 and continue making them grow and that you be compensated for it. And this is what I'm talking about. Okay? But it is what it is. So, Madam Speaker, at the Department of Youth Development and Sports, okay, we, by starting off, we, visit, we visited every single facility on island when it comes to sports, every single one. So we know what they look like, etc. I can even now smell them. So we have taken stock. And then, next on the list was to start meeting each and every association. And 
you know, you meet the associations and then you tell them where you're trying to go, etc., what you're trying to achieve. And what should be our goal, their goal, and St. Lucia's goal, and the ministry's goal, because it is something that we have to marry. And then the aim, Madam Speaker, is to, is to try and come up with what I call a comprehensive plan for the development of sports. And it is not one that we should be able to, after I leave office, for example, or after I've gone to the great beyond, for another person to come and say, and just share that. It has to be one that St. Lucians come up with. It has to be one that is sustainable. It has to be one that is that is a policy. Okay? It has to be one that is part of, part of the structure. Okay? So a lot is being said or was told to the, the, those different associations when it comes to the policies that we want to institute as a department or as a government or as a nation. The policies, the structures, the systems, okay? And we have to make these things work in a way that will bring the most benefits for our island, that will bring the most benefits for our young people, whether you are a cricket pl player, okay, or, or whether you're just doing sports, just for fitness. We have to try and maximize the benefits out there, okay? So, Madam Speaker, so this comprehensive plan that we have to put together, that is in process. And, and just talking about it, Madam Speaker, it is not something that you can just put out there overnight. Okay? And let me just take, Saint, let's, let's look at St. Lucia these days. St. Lucia is history. St. Lucia is, is, it has its own system right now of how things are done. Okay? But I believe change is needed. Okay? So when, when we are thinking of all these things now, change must be instituted. And people have to buy into the change. And so we started this movement to try and put this plan together. And somewhere along the line, Madam Speaker, somewhere along the line, I think we, 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 we have been able to fast, fast forward what we have been doing with the associations. Because the Prime Minister had good friends out there. Mr. Hiller knows that. And we found a gentleman, member for Castro South. Mr. Hiller is. Mr. All right. <laughs> so, the Prime Minister has all his antennas up, okay? Trying to get investments from there and developments from over there and capacities from over there from persons with, you know, the type of capacity we need in this country to do a lot of the different things. So while we are at the department, they're thinking, boy, you know, who can we bring together to, to, to try and get this plan going for us and to put everything together? And we are looking at the different persons all around St. Lucia and so on. And thinking of who might the team be. The Prime Minister called on us and said, the solution is available. We can bring in Mr. Don Lockerbie to help with that plan. And so as I speak, Madam Speaker, Mr. Don Lockerbie is in St. Lucia. We have not formally engaged him, formally in the sense that we do not have an agreement yet. Okay? But hopefully this will be finalized soon. So we will learn a lot more about Mr. Lockerbie as the, as the days and years go by, Madam Speaker. But we are putting this comprehensive plan together for the development of sports. And as I told the different associations, we're not leaving not one stone unturned. We have to turn every stone. We have to think of all the possibilities because we do not want to leave 
one man behind. Not one. Not one boy or girl will be left behind in our plan. Okay? So if you do not want to be part of it, it's your choice. But it will be available for you. But, Madam Speaker, we have limited resources in this country. Very limited resources. And, and I did speak and say that our capacities too are very limited when it comes to management of clubs, management of this, management of that. Sometimes we just do not get it right. And we want to get it right. So, as part of our first, we will have a lot of training. A lot of training. So the persons we need you know, to be in charge of our clubs will be doing training. The, the persons we need to be in charge of our health will be in training. The necessary gymnasiums we need on island, we will look at everything. Okay? Now, I do not want to start going, up, going over a list and for people to accuse me that I left this and I left that out. But it will be comprehensive, Madam Speaker. We will, we will take it all in. And we are not going to do it halfway. Okay? Now, I'm happy, I'm happy that the Prime Minister said that what we need is the plan. We, he will find the money. He's the Minister of the Finance. He's the boss. He will find the money. So, another thing about me, Madam Speaker, when I'm in the planning stage and it goes back to boasting again, I don't, I don't go out there and boast. Okay? When I'm planning, I'm planning. When I'm executing, I'm executing. Okay? Now, Denry has achieved a lot. Denry have, has achieved a lot, Madam Speaker, during the little time that I've represented them. Now, talking about ghetto and all of these things, and they talk about the Prime Minister, talk about Buford has been a ghetto. You have to recognize if you have ghettos, and you have to try and change it for the better. You must do that. You have to try and remove the boys and girls from the block. We have to do that. And when we speak of ghetto, we're not trying to bring down Zen Lucian. We're trying to uplift them. We're trying to tell them, let us get out of there. And we are instituting programs to do exactly that. And this is what this, this motion here today is trying to do. It's a small element, very, very, very tiny. But a lot of things have to come together. I do not want to stay there all day, Madam Speaker, and, and, and go on and on and on and on and on. But, Madam Speaker, this youth development project is part of a continuing effort to reduce youth involvement in crime and violence in the Eastern and Southern Caribbean, while creating alternative pathways for at risk youth and those in conflict with the law. Madam Speaker, the issue of alternative path pathways for at risk youth is a matter of urgent priority and attention. Madam Speaker, at the ninth Commonwealth Youth Ministers meeting in Uganda held last month, that is one of the key items spoken about. And I was present at that meeting. And happy to report that this item was dealt with in a comprehensive way. And while I'm at the, at the Uganda Ministers meeting, let me say to that, Madam Speaker, a lot was achieved at that meeting in terms of what we are going to do with the youth policy that was spoken about. Okay? This is something too that we have to bring to the communities very, very, very quickly. And the discussions with the Commonwealth started. It has to continue for us to formalize an agreement so that for us to know when they can come down to help us bring it out there to the communities. Okay? And after that, it will be time for implementation. So, Madam Speaker, this government is determined to address this matter, and we are working with all our partners in youth development to keep this in the central areas of discussion and action. Madam Speaker, youth empowerment is a process where children and young people are engaged to take charge of their lives. They do this by addressing the situation and then take action in order to improve the, their access to resources 
and transform their con consciousness through their beliefs, values, and attitudes. And, Madam Speaker, we cannot stop. We have to create employment in this country. Employment is the key. Okay, an idle mind is the devil's workshop. We have to engage our youth socially, constructively, you name it. So, Madam Speaker, the Youth Empowerment Model is a free prong approach that effectively engages young people in, in work that challenges them to, to develop skills, gain critical awareness, and participate in opportunities that are necessary for creating community change. And the components, Madam Speaker, still development, the process of strengthening the skills of, of, of young people or the youth so that they know how to effectively make decisions. Critical awareness, Madam Speaker, the process of providing youth with the information and resources necessary for analyzing issues that affect their lives. So that is the kind of thing that the Ministry of Justice, Social Justice, will be involved in, Madam Speaker. The third one, opportunities. The process of providing youth with platforms for decision making and encouraging their active participation in creating community change. Madam Speaker, the resources need to have, the, the resources need is very, very high when it comes to what you want to do for youth in your country. And like I have said, the resources are limited in St. Lucia. We partner with NLA so that everywhere we go, eh, once we meet with our stakeholders, the NLA is there so they understand what we want to do. Okay? And at the end of the day, when we put in this master plan together, NLA will be, will be integral in the formulation of that plan. Another body that, that is ever present in our discussion, Madam Speaker, is the SSI, Sports in Lucia Inc. Now, I want to say here that Sports in Lucia Inc. is not the Sports in Lucia Inc. that existed before. Okay? We have, we have some people on, on this board who are very mindful of what needs to be done for this society to change. Okay? And I will repeat, we still need to increase capacities at all these levels, whether it's the NLA or the SSI, for us to get the job done right. But we are putting our best foot forward. And one of the things that, we, one of the policies that we want to develop as a department or as a nation is for SSI to become the body, the body, the overall body responsible for the management of our sporting facilities on island. I mean, a lot of discussion has to take place on that and, and for us to see where we're going. But we want to have a policy. We want to know at each step of the way what is going to happen when it comes to policies. We want to develop policies. We want to have policies. We want to have structures that, you know, you, don't, you do not just divert from. That you want to stick to and you want to make your systems function the way that they should. So, Madam Speaker, I mean, I can stay here and talk for seven hours, but, Madam Speaker, I thank you. Honorable members, the question is, oh, Mister, are you rebuttal? Honorable members, the question is that Parliament authorizes the Minister for Finance to borrow the sum of U.S. two million eight hundred and sixty thousand dollars from the Caribbean Development Bank's Special Fund Resources. SFR to finance the youth enterprise youth empowerment project and that a the interest is payable at a rate of 2.5 percent per annum on the amount of the loan withdrawn and outstanding and b the loan is repayable in 32 equal or approximately equal and consecutive quarterly installments on each due date 
of the first day of January, the first day of April, the first day of July, and the first day of October, commencing on the first due date immediately following the expiration of four years after the date of the loan agreement or on a later due date that the Caribbean Development Bank specifies in writing. I now put the question. As many are as of that opinion, say aye. aye. As many as are of a contrary opinion, say no. I think the eyes have it. The eyes have it. Honorable Prime Minister and Leader of Government Business. Madam Speaker, I beg that we suspend the House um, for a lunch break until 3.10. Honorable Members, the question is that the House to stand suspended until 3.10 in the afternoon. I now put the question. As many are as of that opinion say aye. aye. As many as are of a contrary opinion say no. I think the ayes have it. The ayes have it. This house stands suspended until 3.10 in the afternoon. And that concludes the morning session of today's House of Assembly sitting from the Government Information Service. I am Alicia Ali. Just to recap what happened this morning, uh, we had a number of statutory instruments being laid here in the House of Assembly. And we have three motions down on the order paper to be dealt with today. However, for the morning session, we have only dealt with the first motion, um, which states that uh, Parliament authorizes the Minister for Finance to borrow a sum in the amount of US 2.8 six million dollars from the Caribbean Development Bank special fund resources to finance the youth empowerment project uh, both members of the government side and the opposition side did agree with the motion um, the question on the floor was really that we need to stop paying so much lip service to our youth and there needs to be more tangible capacity building sustainable programs for our young people here in St. Lucia the second motion, which will be discussed after um, the members of Parliament return at about 3.10 uh, p.m., is that Parliament authorizes the Minister for Finance to guarantee an amount not exceeding EC $15.8 million to secure a payment contract awarded to First Start Construction Company Limited for rehabilitation works at, in Miku South. We have a third motion, which will be a negative resolution proposed by the member for Castries South, opposition member, Honorable Dr. Ernest Hiller. So it promises to be quite an interesting session in the afternoon. Uh, this is the National Television Network, and we're inviting you to please stay tuned. I am Alicia Ali. Thanks so very much for joining us here in Parliament for what probably might be my final broadcast. So please stay tuned. We'll see you this afternoon.